person on the earth. And that's what I want to ask. Are you ready? Yeah. We tried to do it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to call the meeting to order of the um, September 19th, 2017 Planning Board meeting. We have, as you can see, quite a full agenda tonight. Um, even though two of the applicants have decided to uh, postpone their submission to a later meeting, so we will not be reviewing 75 Ocean House Road, private road, private access way, and we will not be reviewing 287 Ocean House Road office building site plan tonight because they have decided to move to the future. So we'll start with approval of last month's minutes. I've got to change. Okay. On uh, page seven, the last sheet, I'll wait for, it says, Mr. Hubner said he's never designed a tower. I said, Mr. Hubner said he's never designed a cell phone tower. Okay. okay. <laughs> but, the, but based on other design experience, okay. tell me when you're ready. But based on other design experience, the steel member sizes and bolt sizes seem small to him. That's it. Motion to accept as amended. Right. <laughs> motion to accept as amended. All right. made a motion. Second. Second, Joe. All right. All those in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Just so people can gauge their time, I'll just do a quick list of what we're going to be covering tonight. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the Strout Tower Consolidation Site Plan. The second item is 27 Fowler Road VB District Zoning Amendments. And then uh, under new business, we'll be talking about Maxwell Woods Residential Development, completeness of the submission. Um, then Comfy Cape Expansion Site Plan Amendment, again, completeness of the submission. And the last item on the agenda is 1226 Shore Road Office Retail Apartment Building Site Plan Amendment. Again, we are looking at completeness. So those are the items that we're going to be discussing tonight. And the first one, from which I have previously recused myself, will be handled by Joe. Hi, everybody. Okay, Tower Specialists, Inc. are proposing to construct a new 180-foot tall telecommunication, telecommunications tower located at 14 Strow Road. The project will also include the remo removal of a 180-foot tall tower and four shorter towers. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulations. Um, so we're going to begin by having the applicant uh, introduce himself and review and summarize any changes that have been made to the plan. I'm Justin Strout. I represent Tower Specialist and the Strout Trusts, uh, who are the applicants for this project. Uh, we basically went through everything and tried to clarify um, by colorizing some of the plans. For the people and the public, um, I just wanted to go over a quick synopsis of what this project involves. Basically, like Joe said, we have um, currently five towers that are going to be removed. One tower will remain. We're trying to make this fit with the 
the neighborhood in the spirit of the, the ordinance as it's written now. Um, I just wanted to, to go over uh, some of these drawings with you guys to show you the coloration. I know you've seen them, but the public hasn't. This is the aerial view of the location of the tower. It's right there. And the nearest uh, residential roads are, this is Spurwink, and then you have down here, this is the Deer Run, I believe. And then this is Tiger Lily and Peppergrass in that area. It's a little bit of an enlargement. The site, the existing conditions plan didn't really change. Um, I think they changed the grading or the gradient of some of the lines, and that was it. This is showing a picture from Wells Road and Spurwink Ave, kind of the corner there, showing what it would look like today. It's pretty much as the naked eye would see it. It's based on a 50 millimeter lens. We have a zoomed in view, so you can see that the uh, larger towers here, and then there's two smaller towers that are visible. There's also two other towers that really are below the tree line at this angle. And during the transition period, there would actually be another tower uh, that we propose to build right next to the existing towers. Once all the equipment is moved to the new tower, then you'd end up with just the two remaining Towers. This would happen probably over a year and a half period, so we expect to be wrapped up in 2019, so that at that point there'd only be two towers. This is kind of a rendition of what it would look like afterwards. This is a zoomed in view from the same location, Spurlink and Wells Road. Uh, so this is what we propose would remain on the site. And it should be able to handle all future co-locations in that area. Um, as well as all our existing equipment. As you can see, we've added color for the existing tree line. We closed it in because apparently there was a line that was left off. So towards the bottom here before, there was nothing. It showed it like wide open, but there's actually a tree line there. Um, I know from the, the site visit, you guys get to see the actual trees and how there is truly a buffer there. This is showing the existing support equipment areas. Um, you can see this is one of the towers that will be removed. That's the one that's got the wider footprint in most of the pictures. And then the other tower is one of the ones that's going to stay. This is what it looks like from above. This is essentially the sport equipment area that's there. We'll be tying into that. So we'll be connecting in to this corner of the fence. And then over here, kind of on the other side of that open gate. Again, we've added color to the site plan to show where the existing tree line is and where we're modifying. I have a large view of this, which is a much better show. I separated out um, for phase one and for phase two, did it by color, uh, seemed like it was clearer this way. So you've got phase one is this yellow area. During construction of that, we'd also do the propane tank area, which is a little bit darker yellow area. And it would tie into the existing support equipment area that I just showed in the previous pictures. Then this is phase two which basically is going to be graded before um, we're done with the whole project uh, during phase one. And the only addition to that for phase two would be actually installing the fence. We don't know if we need that area yet, but we want to have it so that it's set and ready to go um, if there's future customers that would like to, to use that space. In those areas, we're proposing to put a mix of generators, propane tanks, um, equipment slabs, possibly small buildings. Most of the customers are leaning towards um, outdoor equipment, which is basically a slab with just some equipment on it. This is the proposed tower base. 
It's about 60 feet away from the existing tower that will stay. Uh, we tried to nest them together as best as possible to minimize the issue with clearing trees, maximize the buffer, and try to keep the towers so that for most locations in town they look like one tower. And this is the support, this, you know, the support equipment area we're proposing. You can kind of see, I, when you guys were out there, we had it all mapped out. Um, I didn't have time to take the bucket truck back out and take pictures again. But basically, this is going to be phase one in this area, and then phase two would be over in this area. I don't know if you remember the, all the cones that we showed laid out. This is looking towards the east anchor. It's down in some trees will need to be cleared. Um, this is the west anchor, same thing, we'll be clearing trees in that area. And the north anchor, we have to clear minimal trees, I think there's a total of three trees that need to be cleared. Um, this is looking from the proposed gate, looking down the road, showing where the existing structure is. And this is like, right in here is where we'll be building the site. This is where the tower base would be, is about right there. I don't know if you have any questions on specific sheets as to what we changed. Thank you, Justin. Does anybody have any specific questions before I open it to the public? Okay. Uh, is anybody here to speak on this issue? All right, so I'm now opening the hearing to public comment on the item before us. Is there anybody wishing to speak? Seeing none, I am closing the uh, public hearing. Okay, does anybody have any questions or comments or discussions for Justin? Quick question. Yeah. That's okay. Um, I was just looking at some of the notes and I was wondering, is there a note in here um, that would include a provision for um, clearing snow off of the uh, road? You're talking about the letter from the fire chief? Yes, he, yeah. he had two requests. Um, if you want to comment on his yep. request for and, the And actually, I com I'll comment on all of them. Sorry, I, I probably should have just continued on with those. Um, yep. We don't have a problem with coming up with um, basically a, an agreement that will keep the road maintained. It, it's currently plowed and, and cleared 365 days a year. I mean, access to that site is pretty important. So we have responsibilities within um, current leases that we keep it clean and cleared, but we can create one that's specifically for the road from the trust, you know, the, the Strout heirs and anybody who will be controlling it so that the fire chief will be satisfied. Will you be okay if I put that in the condition of approval? Yeah, yeah. We figured it was going to be, so. Okay. Just yep. check. How about the 14-foot uh, width? The 14-foot width, I, I mean, I don't have a problem widening the road, but I think it's, it's kind of difficult because when we were out there, um, 12 feet was probably about the minimum road width on what we're, what we're working with. But the sides just had grass grown in on them. So I just would like clarification on that, um, and the fire chief I spoke to him. I, mean, I got this letter on the 14th, uh, so I just want to clarify with him. But at this point, I don't think 14 feet is a problem. Um, I'd just like to know how he stands on that. Thank you. Okay, and then as far as um, what the engineer, what they had for information, uh, we're totally. I'll have Bob Metcalf redraw, you know, the spillway so that that'll be detailed in, in number six, and we'll address it with Steve Harding. Um, Maureen, can you give us guidance on the 14-foot width issue? Um, I I can. I mean, you have the memo from the police, from excuse me, from the fire chief, and it says he wants a 14-foot wide road. I am uh, reading into that that he wants what we typically see for private for private access way, and 14 feet wide includes an 18 inch depth of gravel. 
and it's 15 inches of type D gravel and 3 inches of the other type of gravel. Um, and so my understanding is that you would have to excavate on either side of that road um, if you do ha not have that type of gravel there right now. Most of the road coming in there is actually like coming up that hill, it's all on ledge. So there would be an easy way to excavate to get the 14 feet. Everywhere else where the road is built up and where we're expanding it, we have no problem going with the 14 foot wide. Uh, but when you come up, when you come off the tarred portion or the paved portion, that's there's no real digging. It was just a layer put over gravel. And, and, and I'm not going to argue with you. I'm I'm just telling you that the standard that's in the the zoning ordinance and the spec that's in the subdivision ordinance is 18 inches deep of two different types of gravel, mm -hmm. 14 feet wide. Okay. Well, I'm confident we can satisfy his concerns. Uh, if that's, if we can go with that. I don't know how we'd put that in a condition of approval. Uh, Maureen, is, the, the requirement is, looks to a support base, and I would think if there's ledge, that that would be an adequate support base in lieu of, you know, a foot of gravel. You um, know, this is the kind of thing usually you work out with the town engineer. Right. I mean, he's the one that, gets the call when the town roads fall apart and um, I'm not going to substitute my meager understanding for his in-depth understanding. Well could the way that is written in our condition which now speaks of a um, minimum travel away of 14 feet and be constructed with sufficient gravel base to support town emergency vehicles uh, in the opinion of the town engineer is it I mean, if you wanted, you, you could probably end that with in the judgment of the town engineer. And that way, if he believes that, you know, the, that a gravel base on top of a ledge is adequate, you know, who am I to argue? Mm -hmm. We're going to, will that, just based on the Ocean House Road thing with the lights, are we setting ourselves up for any problems if by ceding decisions to staff? if I'm saying that correctly. I, I, I do understand and thank you for asking that question. Um, I think because we're talking about a gravel base and the gravel base is defined in the ordinance and we usually go to the subdivision ordinance for our road standards and even in the subdivision <coughs> ordinance it talks about the judgment of the town engineer. I don't think we would be um, illegally delegating, well you would not be illegally delegating the planning board's authority because it really is more of, of a technical assistance type item. I think you'd be okay on that. So we just said with the approval of the town engineer to mm -hmm. condition two, okay. Do we not just say accept the recommendation? We not just say accept the recommendations of the town engineer on the technical matter. The the recommendation came from the fire chief for the fourteen well, foot wide road, and and the fire chief knows what his requirements are, but he's not an engineer, and he relies on the engineer to review plans and designs to make sure that his requirements are being met. Maybe we say something on. Uh, traveled way of 14 feet wide and be constructed with su sufficient gravel base or other uh, material satisfactory satis uh, satisfactory to the town engineer. We amend that at the, at the condition. I would leave the reference to emergency vehicles in there. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Joe. Maureen, were you, are you aware of this uh, issue about the 14 foot wide road came up uh, when the prior tower was approved? Because this isn't the first tower that's going into this property. 
Yeah, I don't remember us looking at it. Um, I think, I mean, this, this facility is becoming the facility for cell phone towers in town. And once a site gets to a certain critical mass, sometimes we look at issues we haven't before. But I do not remember us really looking hard at that road when the um, newer 180 foot tower was, was got approval. The original, the 180 foot tower that's sort of at the bottom of the hill was approved in the 1980s. Okay, but the one that's coming down, that's relatively That's new. the 1980s one. The, the, um, the one that's uh, the closest to the road was built in the 1980s? The, no, the one at the bottom of the hill, which okay. is one of the ones that is coming down, that was the one that was, I think, approved in the 1980s. It was approved prior to the telecommunication provisions that we currently look at. That one, okay. Yeah, the one that's coming down is this one, Jim. Well, there's actually five that, that are coming that down. That one was approved in the 1980s? 89. Oh, wow. All right. I didn't realize it was yeah, that because I was 12 when we built it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. <clears throat> okay, anything else? Good. Chief Gleason also the turning radius and of course I don't know around the bottom. Around the bottom. I guess that's good enough, but I don't know. Good morning. Exactly. So in the subdivision ordinance there are there is a specification and there's reference to the B forty class vehicle and having an adequate turning radius for that vehicle. I think most of us assume that the turning the turnaround at the end of the hill is adequate. But there's nothing that says on the plan that that's going to have to remain in place, um, that it isn't going to be blocked by something. So this is really more of a condition to verify that that turnaround is, is adequate and that it's going to stay there. So we need, we should add language to that into the conditions, I assume? Uh, I would. You don't have any. Traveled way uh, we could well, and the next on the road maintenance agreement they do make reference to the turnaround you know, I, I suspect that's where it would be dealt with uh, number paragraph three in the condition okay. okay all right you missed that okay in in the uh, book that we got there's an acoustic block which is I guess for for a sound reduction where, where do you propose putting that on all the fences? No, it would be put in the fence that wherever it's required. Basically, until we have a generator there to study the sound, we don't know where it would be required. But most likely, it would be the fence that would be paralleling the property line that's the closest. I also know you've got, you submitted, you included information on the stuff you weave into the fence or the acoustical panels. It's okay. not actually woven into the fence. It's um, it's like a thick material that gets tied to the fence. That's so, right, tied to the yeah. fence. So it gets attached to it, and it's it's to help sound deaden anything. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that we've looked into that we could do. We're just not sure what we need to do, and I don't want to be tied to something that's so overkill on our end that it's cost prohibitive. Okay. Um, so we could it could be as simple as doing a berm in between the end of the fence and the property line, it diverts the noise enough so that at the property line the sound isn't, isn't above the 45 dBA. Um, Is that something we can see to the staff to make that decision? Well, I'm, I'm a little concerned that I hear berm because I don't think there's anything in the application. No, 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 I'm just saying, said, I'm but, saying that. But if I could finish, yep. there's nothing in your application that says berm and a berm could potentially require the removal of vegetation and it could potentially change drainage. So I think your application talked about um, acoustic deadening panels. And I, I really think that that's what you're limited to based on the current application. Okay. Because again, I'm trying to look at your, I don't think you can delegate um, whatever technique out there to staff. I think what the applicant, uh, what I understood you to be saying is that this is the kind of technique I will use, and I promise I won't let the decibel level get above 45 decibels yes. at the property line. So that, I think, is enough detail for mm -hmm. the planning board that you're not illegally delegating authority. Okay. But if we're talking about techniques that you haven't detailed in your 
application, I can tell you that I, I suspect that staff would be uncomfortable with that if you came back six months and said that's what you were going to do. No, that's, I understand that completely. I just, my, I guess my point was is I didn't want to be, all right, I don't want to be tied to having to put up the fencing and use panels around each generator if all it takes is the fencing. I'll, I, I just brought the berm up because it, we've been discussing it with somebody else, so um, no berms. We'll stick with them. What, what I've, you know, what I've requested. I guess I just didn't want to get tied to a specific company or a specific piece of equipment for that. Um, that's that's my main concern, I guess. And I and I did since we're talking about this, I did contact CMP and with these beautiful smart meters. There's a lot of things that you can do, and uh, I will tell you that we've had. In 2015, at the site, there was a total of 20 minutes of power outages. And in 2017, we've had a total of 50 minutes of outages, and there were none in 2016. So what we're talking about is the overnight period and when the generators would run. So we have probably haven't had any significant run time other than the exercise program, which would be during the day, as I stated, um, since probably the ice storm in 98. Maybe, maybe there was some more since then. They didn't have the smart meters too far back, so I can't get the records as easily. Uh, but she said she looked back to 2014 and saw nothing. Uh, so I went with those numbers, which I thought was pretty impressive. You usually have more downtime than that. So we're on a pretty good circuit, I guess. Okay, anything else? Would anyone like to make a motion? Uh, do, well, do we have enough? I'm looking at uh, number 16. Do we have enough information to say it will or will not substantially increase noise levels and cause human discomfort? I would say, as detailed in the application, okay. yes. All right, does somebody want to make a motion? Sure. Okay. And yes. Motion for the board to, to consider finding tax. Tower specialists, Inc. are proposing the construction of a new 180 foot tall telecommunications tower located at 14 Strout Road, which requires review under section 19 9 site plan regulations. The plan for the development is consistent with the natural capabilities of the site to support development. Access to the development will be on roads with adequate capacity to support the traffic generated by the development. Access into and within the site will be safe. Adequate provision for parking will be provided under, with section 19-7-8 off-street parking. The telecommunication infrastructure and operation on the site are, in, are incompatible with pedestrian access, therefore no facilities for pedestrians are provided. The plan does provide for adequate collection and discharge of stormwater. The development will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion plan, sub, erosion plan submitted. The telecommunications infrastructure and operation on the site do not require access to potable water. The tele telecommunications infrastructure and operations on the site do not require sewage, sewage disposal. The development will be provided with access to utilities. The development will locate store or discharge material, will not, sorry, locate store or discharge materials harmful to surface or ground waters. The telecommunications infrastructure and operation on the site do not require disposal of solid wastes. The development will not adversely affect the water quality or shoreline of any adequate adjacent water body. 13. The application has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capabilities to complete the project. The development will 
not pro will provide for adequate exterior lighting without excessive illumination. The development will provide a vegetation buffer throughout the area, the site and screening as needed. The development will not substantially increase noise levels and, cue and cause human discomfort. Storage of exterior materials on the site may be visible to the public, will, not, will be screened by fencing or landscaping. The application substantially complies with Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulations and Section 19-8-12 Tower and Antenna Performance Standards. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Tower Specialist Inc. to construct the new 180-foot tall telecommunications tower located at 14 Strout Road and remove the 180 foot tall tower and four shorter towers be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the plan be revised as recommended by the town engineering letter dated 13, 2017. Is, is this where you want to answer? No, the next one. The entire length of the driveway have a minimum traveled way of 14 feet wide and be constructed with sufficient gravel base, base or, other or other material satisfactory to the town engineer. Yeah. And where are we? To, to, support, to, support. Um, to support town. To support town emergency vehicles. That a road maintenance agreement be provided in the form of acceptable in the form acceptable to the town attorney the town fire chief and town manager and signed by the applicant the applicant requires a turnaround to be maintained maintain, maintained of adequate size and radius to accommodate town emergency vehicles that the applicant must provide after the installation of one generator projected DBA level not to exceed 45 DBA at the at the property line of each of each additional generator for a total DBA level in at the property line for all generators associated with the proposed 180 foot tower sound blocking fencing staging scheduling for exorcising generators and other methods shall be employed to limit DBA levels at the property line to no more than 45 DBA there be, that there be no alteration to the site nor issuance of a building permit until the performance guarantee has been submitted in an amount acceptable to the town engineer and the form acceptable to the town attorney and all applicable and, and place, applic acceptable sorry, to the town manager. That, that there be no alteration of the site nor issuance of a building permit until the above conditions have been satisfied by submission of plans and material to the town planner and notification by the town planner that all conditions have been met. Do we have a second? Victoria. Oh. Sorry? Um, number three, when you talk about the road maintenance, Henry, would it be okay? Can we get a second first? Oh, do we need a second? Mm -hmm. Anybody I'll second. Want to second. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Out of order, so. Um, could we possibly add um, on the road maintenance agreement number three at the very end after the word um, town emergency vehicles and include a provision for snow plowing? Include provision for what? Snow plowing. Okay. It doesn't say anything about emergency vehicles on section three. You're talking about the second. One, um, oh, sorry, accommodation of town vehicles. Yeah, sure. sure. Does the second accept that? Oh, you do. I do. <laughs> All right, anything else? All right, I'll approve. I mean, <laughs> All in favor. <laughs> All opposed. It's unanimous. Thank you guys. Have a good evening.
All right, next item on the agenda, 27 Fowler Road, BB District Zoning Amendments. The Town of Cape Elizabeth Town Council <laughs> has referred to the Planning Board a request by Brad Pearson to change the zoning for 27 Fowler Road from Residence A to Business B and to make text changes to the Business B Zoning District to permit a landscaping contractor. Section 19-10-3 Amendments. And uh, this is a public hearing, and uh, I'm going to ask the town planner to give an overview of this item. You want me to run my them? Yes. Okay. All right. Since people have joined us since uh, I opened the meeting, uh, just a reminder that two of the items on the agenda have been withdrawn for this evening. Uh, 75 Ocean House Road. Uh, private road, private access way, and 287 Ocean House Road office building site plan. Um, so in case somebody came in for those, we're not going to be talking about them. So I'm just going to pull up the zoning map. So uh, what the planning board has been asked to do is the town council has referred to you a request from the Pearsons, Brad Pearson, to rezone 27 Fowler Road. 27 Fowler Road is currently in the RA district. That's the residential district. The minimum lot size is 80,000 square feet. And he has asked for the property to be placed, moved into the business B district. And I will finally get to that map right here. So the 27 Fowler Road is located right here. This is all RA. Any part of the property across the street that's not wetland is RA. This is RA. This, this bright pink is the BB district, and this is where the Earthworks facility is. And then this uh, purple is the town center district. So what the applicant has asked is for that property to be put into the BB district, one, and two, 
they want to operate a landscape contractor business. And currently, the provisions of the BB district do not list a landscape contractor as a permitted use. So in addition to the map amendments, there are also landscape contractor text amendments to the zoning ordinance. And those text amendments um, create a, a permitted use called a landscape contractor. There's some definitions. I can put those up there. And then there was an effort, because we're adding a use and because we know there are abutting residential properties, uh, when we created the Earthworks facility contractor use, this computer is not happy with me tonight, um, there are restrictions on earthwork contractors. And for example, there's a minimum lot size of 20 acres for an earthwork contractor. So landscape contractor use was treated similarly. It wasn't just thrown in as a permitted use, but there are proposals to, do, to have some performance standards to make sure the landscape contractor business doesn't overwhelm the site. So it has a 40,000 square foot minimum lot, lot size. Uh, there are requirements that no more than 50% of the lot be used for exterior storage, that that exterior storage needs to be completely enclosed with a six foot high stockade fence or a landscape buffer, um, and that you cannot be, for example, you can't be storing materials on the site for retail sales. So the only materials that would be stored on the site are materials that the landscape contractor would be using. Uh, the welding uh, activities on the site would be limited to only what you need to do to maintain a landscape contractor business. Um, the landscape contractor business would include snow plow, uh, snow removal services, but not, not snow storage. And then there is the one that's been brought up to you, which is the idea about re um, controlling the size of the vehicles. So the adjacent earthworks contractor um, is a 20-acre site and they use very large vehicles. And because the earthwork contractor is proposed to have less than a one acre minimum lot size, 40,000 square feet, one of the ways to distinguish between the earthwork and the landscape or business and to try to reduce the impact was to try to make sure that landscape size trucks are the only sizes that are being used. And I'm bringing this up because it's an issue of continuing debate um, right now, the amendment is 14,000 square feet, 14,000 pounds gross vehicle weight, which is larger than the, um, the truck that the applicant pointed out to the planning board during the site visit. So that was the, the goal to accommodate that new truck. But there's nothing that says the planning board has to have any kind of restriction on vehicles or you could have something that's larger. I just wanted you to be aware of that. Are there any questions? I just wanted everyone to have an overview of what was going, what the issue is. And I'm going to open this for public hearing. Uh, if anyone wishes to comment, uh, they may come to the podium, state their name and their street address. And you have three minutes um, that we ask you to keep your comments to. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? We have received some emails, so um, we have received some public input. Um, my name is Nancy Castle. I live at 9 Great Pond Terrace, which is off a townhouse development that is off Baller Road. I'm not so concerned with making that, that area commercial because I think they're operating a commercial business there today. But what I do want to bring to the planning board's attention is the amount of congestion these large trucks are causing within Fowler Road. And that is, you know, people, it's very difficult. I have dogs to walk dogs. You see bikers, you see joggers, you have all those folks. And we have very large trucks, both from Murray and this new business as well, as well as other landscapers coming up and down that road. I know that Fowler Road was also in the speed assessment that was done, but it doesn't account for the large size of the vehicles and there's no egress for people walking on the side of that road. So as we add traffic, I think there's a consideration that needs to be made by the board about what can be done to either widen that road or create some type of pedestrian walkway that will allow safety. That's also a crosswalk for the Crosstown Trail as well, people cutting across over to Fenway. So that, that's my only consideration. I realize it's not it's precisely germane to this particular matter, but I think that as we continue down this path with commercial places on both ends of the street, that we need to consider that. Thank you. 
Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Seeing no one, I'm closing the public hearing. Up, oh, oh, you got to be faster. <laughs> if if you do wish to speak, because in the interest of time, because we have a very large agenda, please stand up now and line up over by the windows. If otherwise, you might miss your chance. Go ahead. Good evening. My name is Nell Hannig. Um, I also live in the Great Pond Terrace uh, condos. Um, I just learned about this um, last week, and that's why I hadn't been here before. Um, my concern is this is, again, a very narrow road. It's a narrow residential road with a residential character. Um, we already have impacts from the gravel company of um, noise, dust, large equipment storage, traffic, and safety, as been mentioned. Um, we have dog walkers, we have kids on bikes, we have people walking. It's already a pretty dangerous situation. Um, adding more trucks to the mix seems problematic to me. Um, I also feel like this would set a precedent. If the planning board is willing to change the zoning on a residential road for a commercial use with this many impacts, why wouldn't in future you receive any number of requests to uh, change zoning to commercial on Fowler Road for businesses that would have less impacts. And before we know it, we have not a residential character anymore, but a road that is commercial and residential. So um, I would really um, encourage you to consider this vote. Um, I, I don't think it would be a good addition to the road. I don't think we'll add anything to the town and certainly it will um, have negative impacts on people who live on Federal Road. Thank you for your attention. Excuse me, can, can I have your name again? Oh, certainly, sure. Nell, last name Hanig, H-A-N-I-G. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, my name is Greg Salerno, 25 Mantor Street. Um, I'm just standing up to support this venture that Brad wants to do. I mean, it's next to a gravel pit right now. Um, I respect the other community members with their concern about trucks on a very narrow road, but every road in Cape Elizabeth is narrow. I live on Manter Street, and every Thursday there is at least three to four to six landscaping trucks on my street. So it's not that it's something that's unusual to have landscaping trucks on the street. I just would like to add that, that you know, we hear about young people being chased out of the state of Maine, and here's a young man that grew up in Cape Elizabeth that wants to have his business here. And I think the town council can set an example that's saying we want our young people to have small businesses here as opposed to chasing them away. So with that, I'll, I'll end that. And you know, I have two sons that grew up in this town. I hope they come back to Cape Elizabeth. I just hate to see them chased away. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Michelle Boyer, 333 Fowler Road. Um, I oppose it for the same reasons um, of the traffic concerns, and certainly it's not um, to chase young boys away from town or young men. Um, if the town is going to approve it, I think there's things that you could add um, to address the safety concerns on Fowler Road. Perhaps more resources for the police department, because as you know from, if you've had a chance to look at the speed study, that was done and presented to the town council. Over 80% of the cars that are going down Fowler Road are not going 30 miles an hour. So if there's um, not an ability to enforce the speed limit, that is some, some concern when you talk about adding additional trucks and additional vehicles. Fowler's already used as a cut through road. Um, so this will bring more employees and more, you know, whoever is going to be dropping materials at the site. So it is definitely an increase in traffic. And uh, like others have said, there's already serious concerns with traffic on the road. Thanks. Excuse me, could you tell what number fell the road? 333. Three, three. Thank you. Did you catch that? I didn't catch that. Is there anyone else? All right, I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank you all for your comments. And I'm going to open it for board comment, questions, concerns. 
Go right ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you raise your hand? No, 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 you're no first. you were first. Oh, okay. You were first, Jim. Sorry, I didn't. Um, in, in the past, I've vacillated on this, and uh, I don't think I can, I mean, I won't be able to support this zoning change as it's written because of the unintended consequences, in my opinion, of changing this one parcel to BB, because if you look at how many other properties abut that, if, while well, the present owners probably have no intention of becoming landscape contractors, they sell 10, 20 years down the road, and what would be our response to them if they want to be landscaping contractors? So um, then it snowballs, and uh, anyway, I don't think I can support it. All right, Peter? <coughs> yeah, uh, Maureen, just for clarification, were this to be adopted, they would still have to get site plan approval for the operation, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Um, I, I was marginally in, in favor earlier, I guess, although with concerns based on traffic and what Jim just raised. Um, our site walk uh, revealed another side to this, which uh, left me with a lot of concern. The, uh, the, the front part of the lot, the screening on the abutting uh, property, which is in the RA district, um, is quite dense, and this change would not affect it because the storage would be in the back. However, the property owner, for reasons that uh, I can't understand, erected a large berm of, I don't know, probably 20 to 30 feet earthwork, um, and uh, I assume that was what he was thinking would isolate his storage area from the, uh, the neighboring abutting property. That to me is just um, totally unacceptable. Not only does it encroach on the abutting property, but it's, it's unsightly and there's been some concern about erosion ever since. Um, so part of my concerns, I guess I would express at the site plan level if this were to be approved, but the, um, the, the impact of the back of that uh, lot being used for storage of materials and vehicles adjacent to the, um, uh, to the abutting uh, residential property leaves me with a lot of concerns and I, would, I just think there has to be a pretty careful job done if we go forward to protect the, that area visually from the way it is now, which uh, I would find to be unacceptable. Well, I, I actually support the, the change of the zoning plan. I think this is a unique piece of property that um, is surrounded on two sides uh, by uh, the gravel pit already. And what I learned on the sidewalk is actually the back part of the property already has an easement uh, with the gravel pit that's allowed to actually run through that piece of property. I do think, as Peter echoed, that we're not to the point that um, site plan review is being uh, discussed. This is just strictly the zoning, the request for a zoning change and uh, the text amendment. Um, I like the fact that if we can keep businesses in Cape, um, the understanding is that a lot of these landscaping contractors have to go out of town uh, to where they can actually keep their vehicles, their equipment, their trucks, and then actually come back into town um, to do their actual work. So this isn't a situation where if we don't approve this that landscape contractors won't, ha won't be going on in Cape. What it will do is it'll allow a business that started in Cape, does the vast majority of business in Cape Elizabeth, uh, to maintain its equipment in Cape Elizabeth. I think the restrictions um, that the guidelines that go along with this text amendment uh, for land landscape contractors yard are strict. Um, they're specific and they would limit what uh, a person uh, in a BB district would be able to do with this. So I would support, support the change uh, to the zoning map and to the, to the text. Go ahead, Victoria. Uh, we did receive some new material that I haven't commented on. In the past, I've made my comments and the board's clear with those. Um, but according to a letter from the Code Enforcement Officer dated February 23rd, uh, 2015, 
uh, there was a code violation and there's still a code violation regarding a new dwelling unit above the garage and I don't want to interject myself between the code enforcement officer but um, I would point out that that um, only a single family dwelling unit is allowed in the BB district if this becomes a uh, two family a multi-family it's not allowed uh, there seems to be questions around um, uh, zoning violations. Um, we did receive a letter from the abutters uh, saying about um, how the berm is encroaching upon their property it, and, the, and they spoke to the Pearsons and the berm actually grew bigger. I don't want to interject but there does seem to be some issues um, that do need to be uh, clarified before um, I would even feel comfortable doing uh, the site plan review. Uh, what I've always said from the very start, and I'll say it again tonight just for the record, and this is the public hearing, is um, I've always been focused on the justification, the demonstrated need for this change. I always felt the burden should be on the applicant to demonstrate he cannot reasonably locate his business any other location, and that it has to be 27 Fowler Road. I am all for um, people staying uh, local. I'm all for encouraging business. Um, I just don't know why um, when we have um, property, uh, there's a very large piece for sale right there, um, there's property. Why does it have to be 27 Fowler Road? Um, once again, I would lean towards allowing the zoning change if there was maybe a demonstrated public need for the proposal that just can't be reasonably be met elsewhere. Um, finally, I'm concerned because zoning by nature allows certain uses on some land and not on others, and rezoning can award economic benefits to the property owner. And if this property is rezoned as business, when the property owner goes to sell their lot, they can sell the lot as commercial and residential, while their neighbors can only sell as residential. So I see this as an economic advantage uh, bestowed through zoning. Um, I, I see this as a non-conforming use in the RA. It, it doesn't belong, and we're amending the zoning ordinance to allow a non-conforming use where LP Murray was a pre-existing um, use, and I think that's why they're right in the middle of a residential um, district. But um, I, I never was for rezoning this commercial. It, it should remain residential. Um, I would also agree um, unintended consequences. What is going to happen? if the rest of the neighborhood says we should go commercial. Um, I think this is something that's bigger than this board possibly uh, brought to, uh, some, yeah, to review the zoning maybe in that area if we want this to be commercial, um, but I'm going to not support this request. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, I'm also not gonna support the request. Um, I think that with zoning, with a rezone, there's really nothing objective that you can look to in the ordinance to make a decision. It's really, do you think this is um, an advantage to the town? And I, while I certainly see an advantage to Carl and, uh, and his son for the rezoning, I don't see an advantage to the town, so I'm not going to support it. Any, any comments? No. <laughs> I'm, I'll refresh. I'm actually, I vacillate as well. Um, I, I see problems with, with traffic, and my only concern is it, it looks like we've looked at it afterwards, and, and you know, we're, we're cookie cutting it to fit in with an existing system. And, and so I, I really can't support it, to be honest. Right. Well, I've, I've also gone back and forth on this and uh, on the site walk I'm, I'm looking at the property going it's already in the middle of a, of a gravel pit um, but then I, I also have concerns about the berm and I, have con I also have concerns about the fact that there has been a code violation uh, on the property and nothing has been done to rectify that so going forward what what would happen so I've really struggled with this one 
because I would like to support somebody uh, having a business in town. I think it's a, it's a very positive thing. But this one has been very, very difficult for me. And uh, I, I think based on what I've read today, um, I don't think I can support this going forward either. So. Well, since I'm the only one in support of it, I, I, if I make a motion, I don't think it's going to be seconded. So <laughs> there's really no point to make a motion. Would someone like to make a motion, Peter? A uh, motion for the board to consider create an order that, based on the map and proposed text amendments and the facts presented, the request of Brad Pearson to change the zoning for 27 Fowler Road U20-10 from Residence A to Business B and to make text changes to the BB district regulations to permit a landscaping contractor not to be recommended to the town council. Yes, sir. Okay. Then motion and seconded by Jim. Um, all those in favor? <coughs> opposed? We have one opposed. All right. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. Next item on the agenda, Maxwell Woods. Maxwell Woods LLC is requesting major site, yeah, major subdivision final plan review, amendments to the previously approved Spurring Woods subdivision, a resource protection permit. I know everybody's getting their papers, so it's kind of crazy. Resource protection permit and site plan review of 38 condominium units and two four-unit apartment buildings located at 112 and 1 through 114 Spurlink Avenue. Section 16-2-4, Major Subdivision Review Completeness, and Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Completeness, and Section 19-9, Site Plan Review Completeness. So we're looking at completeness tonight. So. Would you like to give us an overview, a, a quick overview of the project? I'm going to try. Okay. <laughs> Pointing on any changes or that may have occurred? Absolutely. Um, slide. Um, the bottom left hand, the third thing. Is this one? Right there. Okay. I am trying to perform. Yeah, I've left you some challenges over there. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Owen McCullough, an engineer with Sebago Technics here tonight on behalf of Maxwell Woods LLC. Um, this project has been for, before the board and, uh, a number of times here um, over the past year, really. And I put this slide up here just to sort of give a quick recap, I'm going to try to keep my presentation to new materials. When we submitted the big book you have in there is really a compilation of everything we've done to date. So it's complete. Uh, a lot of the information is information received at preliminary plan approval, but for continuity we assembled everything together in the final uh, packet al pack along with us. 18 page cover letter that went through all the criteria, most of which you have read and seen uh, in the past. So there isn't a whole lot new to that, uh, but I'll walk you through the pieces that have, have, have changed or been supplemented. So we, I just looked at the number of meetings, so we actually started this meeting uh, back in, or this project back in as early as 2016 when we had a workshop uh, with the planning board in June. We went to the Conservation Commission uh, just after that. Uh, complete this review for preliminary plan approval was in January of 2017. Uh, we had a public hearing the following month. Uh, we walked. A, we did a site walk in February. If everybody remembers the snowstorm, I'm trying not to remember that quite yet. <laughs> it's coming again. Uh, the Conservation Commission completed another review in April of 2017. We came back to the Planning Board in May of 2017 to receive uh, preliminary plan approval. 
Then we went to the Council for Conditional Municipal Approval, which was granted on June 12th of 2017. So that entire process uh, got us to this point uh, tonight, which we're here for a final plan uh, completeness review for the project. Um, what we've updated since the last meeting has really been following that uh, checklist for the final plan submittal. And uh, what's in there that's, that's new materials or updated materials is we've now prepared the deeds and easement descriptions that are required for the final plan review process. We've updated plans with meets and bounds of all the easements and specifics for that. These easements have been submitted to the town's attorney who is, I think, working with the applicant's attorney uh, to make sure everything is all set for um, before we come back for a final plan approval. So that process is involved, is ongoing. Uh, we also submitted the homeowners association documents uh, that were updated and those are also um, undergoing review. We are required to submit a project cost estimate uh, mostly to establish a performance bond should the project be approved. And then uh, the town's peer review engineer, uh, Steve Bradstreet, has uh, completed a review which we've responded to and we've also responded to the main Department of Environmental Protection's review, mostly around stormwater management, the narrative portion of which is included in your application. Uh, I had some email correspondence with Christine Woodruff from the main DEP and it looks like they're working towards uh, generating a permit sometime here over the next couple of weeks. Um, so if all would go well by the time we're back for final plan approval, I hope that we'll have that permit in place. And so what we submitted tonight is for the uh, completeness review tonight, we would uh, should it be deemed complete, we would obviously be back um, probably the following month for a final plan uh, review. Um, again, just what's up in front of you here is the uh, uh, layout of the project, which is uh, 38 uh, condominium type units um, and also eight multiplex units, uh, two fourplex. Uh, apartment type buildings. Uh, the road uh, that would be coming in, there would be a public road uh, that would be constructed coming in. This would be the private portion of the site surrounded by uh, the open space and trail networks. We've had pretty substantive discussions over the past over uh, the landscaping between the two units, uh, which I think at the last meeting we were uh, pretty close or we had gotten there on a pretty aggressive landscaping plan, actually a nice trail corridor up through there. Uh, in Maureen's or in the staff review comments for completeness, uh, there was a uh, item listed about the landscaping to include the counts, uh, a table of the landscaping. Our landscape plan, which is in your packet, details the number of each tree species and planting species on the on the plan, but it was suggested, I think, to put it in a table form, Maureen, to make it a little easier for folks to read. So we can certainly uh, do that. I've also included on this plan uh, the landscaping that would go along with the condominium units and the apartment units. Those showed uh, specific uh, landscaping types, which we'll also put in tabular form, which I think is what one of the requests was. So we'll certainly do that. There's a center detail here, which um, is a little hard to read up here, but that's landscaping around transformer pads. There was some discussion about that at one of the past meetings, so uh, we will have uh, pretty aggressive landscaping around the transformer pads. If you ever visited the uh, Eastman Meadows project, you can, you'll see there is quite a bit of landscaping around those transformer pads. I happened to be there earlier uh, this summer. Um, one other, a um, couple of other items I just wanted to make note of. Uh, the applicant, uh, this project will include two low income affordable housing units. 
the applicant is actually for the other projects and I'll make sure you have a copy of that for the final but crafted a, a very specific uh, agreement affordable housing agreement between the town and himself that was used uh, at Eastman Meadows um, I think it was pretty uh, successful uh, and Maureen I think last time some other folks in other communities have actually looked to use this as a as a guide uh, for affordable housing now we are picking we have added a note to the plan that talks about um, uh, two units uh, those general locations where those would be and I believe that's included on uh, note 28 and at this point the applicant is thinking of units two and three which is here or here and units 27 and 28 uh, maybe one in this building and one in either of these buildings I would ask and we've talked about this with the applicant I think at one of the meetings there was a discussion about where would these units go uh, we specify or we've tried to give an idea of where they would go but when the applicant starts constructing the units at a certain percentage of completion then the applicant has to uh, construct one of the affordable units or have that available which he's done in Eastman Meadows if when these go on the market some people because we're building the whole thing right so we're not doing any phasing there are folks that put orders that, um, that Joel will work with who may want to build over here first or maybe want to, may want to build over here first. So it can be that the units get built not starting at the beginning and progressing all the way through in a, uh, in a, a sort of a progressive sequential manner. So if that happens, the applicant had, would like to see if there's a way that they might be able to uh, pick another unit as they come through here depending on the development pattern of the project. Um, all the units are the same so it's not like uh, one unit is going to be different from the other. They're constructed uh, identical. Um, so um, he would like to have some flexibility to be able to do that. I, I put, we put that up there for the board's consideration. It's it would be a shame to if you know we started building this and let's say half the units got over here and we wanted to put an affordable over here because uh, that's where all the development's happening right now instead of having um, maybe an isolated unit in another location so it's something for the board to consider um, I don't know if that's um, how we can make that flexible we ha we're obligated by the code and Maureen you would have to help me on this but I think it's after 50 percent the first one what's the percentage I, I'm sorry I'm making you look through but it's very stipulated and and the applicant has to follow that that stipulation uh, for it and then I think they have to the agreement has to be offered for at least six months uh, for prospective low-income uh, folks and there's a process that goes through and how those people get submitted they submit to the town the uh, town administers it um, but it's a it's a very prescriptive process as outlined by the the agreement so Maureen did I get that reasonably right <laughs> you, you, yeah you for your project you, you nailed it so um, you know the affordable housing provisions are very important uh, the town, I think, has had a lot of success with making sure that what people promised to build, they actually did build, and they're occupied by people who um, meet the income requirements. And uh, We originally had a little bit of concern about these not being built, so this provision has been written that says you basically have to build the affordable units in proportion to the market rate units. So there are 38 condos, Correct. two low income. The first low income would have to be built yeah. it would have to be no later than unit 19 so building permit 19 or earlier would have to include the first low income unit and then the second one could be last um, just for the board when you are applying these standards one of the standards you have to uh, make uh, finding 
is that um, where is it? you're supposed to find that the, the units are geographically dispersed throughout the development. And that is one of the reasons you need to know which unit it is. Um, the other reason is because we need to track it in our office and it's kind of hard to figure out what is the 19th unit when you're issuing 38 permits over time. We have, however, I, I think there is some opportunity for the planning board to show some flexibility if the applicant were to identify the two units that are the low income affordable units and then you do have that uh, administrative de minimis change opportunity which has been used a couple of times and I'm looking at Mr. Curry and Ms. Jordan because as chairs they both have signed off in some of those really tiny changes and I think you could even approve that with a condition that moving the unit around could be approved as a de minimis change if the applicant needed to. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Um, there were a couple of other items that I just wanted to touch on. Um, in the site plan review uh, notes, there's one about the lighting uh, for the uh, apartment buildings. Uh, we will make sure that that is on the plan for the final submittal. I can tell you that uh, I spoke with Joel. His intent is to only install uh, low wattage uh, LED lights at the entry points to the building only. And we will designate that on the plan with a uh, luminaire and a the photometrics that go along with it. But it would be very... Uh, traditional of a, like a residential porch light that would go on. There's no spotlights or no, uh, this is a residential setting, so we certainly don't want that. Uh, the last item was uh, DBA levels should be estimated. And that's where I just, uh, since we're here talking about this, I just wanted a little help, maybe, and maybe more than we could talk about that before final submittal on what we would need to provide because the ordinance chapter 12 that it talks about um, this is a residential setting that the levels daytime hours shall not exceed what is reasonable and consistent with daily living the applicant certainly doesn't want to have you know they want quiet enjoyment for the types of tenants they have so I, I we could estimate what I guess is traditional residential type noise levels and then it would be consistent with the ordinance? Is that reasonable? Um, it's, it's critical for the planning board for the applicant to put something in your application that gives us a number to base the approval on. Okay. So um, I think there's a couple of different ways that you could go about it. We've heard about people who have used um, apps to measure sound levels. Um, you can do some research and there are charts that are online available yeah. that estimate sound levels based on type of use. Um, but it is a burden on the applicant to actually provide that information. But I think I, I'd be happy to work with you on it. No problem, we can do that. Is that, I, I guess, because when I think of noise levels, is that an average noise level because... I'll work with you on it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I will move on. <laughs> um, I'm more than happy to um, go through any of the detailed items on the submittal. We've been through most everything on the submittal quite extensively, so I was trying to focus uh, the presentation tonight just on the completeness review and then give the board a chance to ask any questions so hopefully we could get prepared to come back with a final plan submittal. So, thank you. Thank you. Go right ahead. I just wanted to point out to the board that when you granted preliminary approval, you granted preliminary approval for the subdivision resource protection permit, subdivision amendments to the Cottage Brook, now known as the Spurwin Woods subdivision. But as staff, we decided that the, uh, the two apartment buildings really should, in order to make sure we do dot all our I's and cross all our T's, should also get site plan review. And there's no expectation that there's any information that hasn't already been covered under subdivision that isn't going to be included for site plan, but um, didn't want to leave that as a question once this uh, project gets a final vote. So that's why that's also in there for you. 
Thank you. Thank you. All right. We will um, now take, as with every every item on the agenda, we do allow a period of public comment. This isn't an official public hearing. This is an opportunity to speak um, on completeness, and we are looking solely and ask people to uh, keep their comments to completeness, which is, do we have the information necessary to move forward and make a, a decision on it? doesn't have to be perfect. We still, as you can tell, have some changes that need to be made and some, some information that needs to be uh, reinforced. But uh, can we make a decision on whether this is a complete package of this, this evening? So. Please uh, state your name and uh, address and uh, ask you to... My name is Pete keep, Dixon. <coughs> keep your comments at, uh, to three minutes. Uh, I didn't hear that. Your name? Peter Dixon. Thank you. And I live at... Uh, hold on just a moment. I'm unscrewing your thing here. <coughs> I live at uh, 29 Westminster Terrace. There we go. Um, <clears throat> I'm concerned about this two acre farmland piece that we've got. Uh, this is the uh, Cape Elizabeth website. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in here. Subdivision ordinance, and press that, and we get subdivision ordinances down here. <clears throat> press that, and here is chapter 16, and this is on uh, this is the what do you call it, the ordinances that are, uh, we're dealing with now. Uh, I've taken some parts out of it. Oops, go back to where I started. So uh, here's the ordinance, and uh, down here on page number 10 is where we're really going to go. But we're going to initially go to where it says definitions on page 2. Uh, uh, here's the definitions, and the definition, this is, our, this is our own ordinance, unless it's been changed, the definition of farmland is 5 acres. Now, has that been changed since last November? Actually, less than a year ago? No. No. Okay. So we, we need five acres of land to can make it a farmland. At least that's what I read here. Um, <clears throat> then we get on to Article 3, and it's talking about subdivision uh, review standards. And down at the bottom of sub, or here's... Uh, Here's the different things, and we go down to uh, G, which is aesthetics. But I just did this with a, a word search on, mm -hmm. on your document. And it says farmland, all farmland within proposed subdivision shall be identified on maps submitted uh, as the application. So have we submitted farmland on this application? We have? Yeah, as far as I know. Okay. So here's the spot. This is the spot here that we're looking at. If you take a look at the web source, it's called the, whoops. You take a look at the web source, it's uh, for uh, a web soil survey. And so here it is again, that is the same two things. Mr. Dixon, could you get to your point, you, your time is up, could you get to your final point? Okay, here's the final point. Here's what we, here's the kind of stuff that we have approved in the past. Right there. Here is a subdivision that was approved. This is farmland, what do you call it? It's uh, PBE, whatever it is. This is prime farmland, and this is farmland. Are we trying to save this little tiny chunk of good farmland? It's a two acre piece. There's probably only a quarter of an acre, maybe, maybe less. I just think that, that something funny is happening. And uh, so here's the web soil survey. You can go to it. You can find it. 
real easy to use. Here's what the present place looks like now. Anybody interested? It is not being farmed, it's just got overgrown story. And this was taken from Canterbury side of the property, if you'll notice I've got I'm looking through the trees. Okay. okay? Yes. Thank you. So we're just pulling by. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Jeanette Baum, um, I live at 85 Spurring, um, which is pretty much almost a directly across the road from where this is being developed. Um, so I've avoided these meetings knowing that it's an emotional thing for me, um, having a big development going across the street, and I can say wholeheartedly I'm not supportive of it. Um, but also knowing that it might happen, there are some things I want considered, um, considering it will affect our life. Um, pretty significantly and he moved in in January um, and hoped to be lifelong Cape residents and build a family here um, so in terms of things that I really would like considered um, and I know Maureen I emailed about you about this today and I know some of it's been discussed already um, but the traffic on the road similar to what we heard about Fowler Road is a huge concern for me um, adding 80 potential people with cars in this area, um, it will have a huge impact on a road that basically doesn't have shoulders, where there's already a lot of people walking, waiting for buses, riding their bikes. Um, and so I would like that considered as part of it. Um, I know that might not be normal process, but in terms of a comprehensive way to approach this, as a Cape Elizabeth resident, I hope we could think about it comprehensively um, with the whole community in mind, rather than just this because it's a private road, uh, not thinking about the road that it's coming off of. Um, the other things I'd really like, or actually a question I have, um, is the landscaping around the pond, what that'll be, if that's just open area or not, um, like a field or what it is, I guess it's just a question. The pond is not part of the development. So that's going to stay wooded around it, or is it going to be cleared out? Let me know. It, but based on the Maxwells, which are, they're wonderful. I, I mean, um, so that isn't part of it. So that's all gonna stay wooded, which means that it'll be somewhat hidden. So then I guess that leaves my biggest concern in terms of our house being impacted by this, thinking about the cars coming out of this private road and how that will affect us at all hours of the day. Um, it's not a large plot. Um, and so we'll see the lights coming through the window at night, we'll hear, the car is coming in and out, um, and then the speeding and pedestrian issues is definitely a concern. Um, the final question is around construction and just all the sound, dust, um, and traffic that will come from that. I think Maureen mentioned there was a construction road being considered, um, but if that's right in front of our house, I'd definitely love to hear more about um, how that's being managed and what's being thought about in terms of how it will impact the community. Thank you. You will be hearing more about it. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? All right, seeing no one, I'm closing the public comment period. All right, board members, what do you have to say? Go ahead, Victoria. I don't personally have any um, questions about is this complete or not complete, but um, the last speaker did mention traffic, and, I, and if it wasn't known, a traffic study has been done. That's why I do find that this would be complete, because there are questions around traffic, but a traffic study was done. Jonathan? And just to reiterate that point a little bit, when this came in, I think it was about a year ago, that. The traffic study was requested not just for the units that were going to be added to Maxwell Woods. We actually had them do a, uh, a larger traffic study for all the units that were contained in Cottage Brook to be included on that traffic study. Uh, so I'd urge any citizens that have any uh, issues with that to take a look at the complete traffic study that was requested and was done by the applicant. Any 
Peter. A uh, question maybe for Owens. The, uh, one of the things that you've done in this set of plans is detail the uh, landscape plan, <coughs> excuse me, uh, between Cottage Brook and this development along the path, and it's, you've been quite uh, extensive with it. You also have a note talking about a supplemental landscape plan for the apartment units, which was on your first slide, but is that in this package here? I couldn't find it. Uh, so, so for the, the apartments? Hmm? Uh, I'm sorry, for the apartments, Peter? Uh, yeah, on sheet uh, 24, it's the there's a reference there that says the supplemental landscape plan uh, is a separate plan for the review. If, if I could help, Mr. Curry, yeah. I also looked for that. It's on the bottom of that page. And the reason I could figure out is I looked at the footprint. Oh. Yeah. It Down took there. me a while, too. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, was I, I really wasn't hiding it. <laughs> I was looking on another page. And, uh, okay, I, I think that takes care. There are a number of times where you, you identify trees with a X, and some are going to be deciduous, and some are going to be pine tree. This is something that will be filled in later, I take it? Go ahead. That, that particular um, detail for the apartment units, that was what my comment was relating to. If we could actually have one of those oh, landscape or, charts yeah. that says this how many of the dwarf father gillas and this how many of the oaks, et cetera. Okay, so the, the, the graphic display where all the circles have an X in them, it could be one or the other. This doesn't get focused on this stage, right? Well, look, I, you know, I, I think having a chart pretty much next to yeah. that actual So they have detail. the same symbol for deciduous and, and, and coniferous. That's the only point of making. Right. Usually there's there's letters and there's a key and that's what I think they need to like flesh out in that chart. Okay. Thanks. I'm good. Are there, yeah, any, the comments? Are there yes. any comments on completeness? Any other comments on completeness? Would anyone like to make a motion? Joe. Motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joel Fitzpatrick doing business as Maxwell Woods LLC for final subdivision review, a resource protection permit and site plan review of the Maxwell Woods development, including 38 condominium units and eight apartments and two buildings, and amendments to the previously approved Spurwink Woods subdivision related to the road extension be deemed complete. Do you have a second? Second. <laughs> I saw Jim's hand first. <laughs> All right, any other comments? All those in favor? Uh, it's unanimous. Thank you for your time this evening. Oh, we're not done yet. Oh, we'll stay we're right still, still here. Okay. Good. Because the next thing we're going to do is schedule a site walk. Oh, perfect. Any comments from the board before you? Well, let's let's walk. schedule the site walk and then we can comment. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Now that we found it. Because I don't want to forget the site walk. And let's make it sometime before November so it doesn't snow. <laughs> oh, I'm just teasing. Okay. So, Do you want to do evenings or weekend? Evening or weekend? Evening. Evening. Evening? <clears throat> Uh, I like weekends. <laughs> What's the earliest people can do it in, on a weekday? Yeah. Keeping in mind it's now getting it's now getting dark around seven. So that's right. Yeah. Five thirty. Five thirty. Typically, you try to do this before um, the next meeting. Are you available this week or next week? Next week. Um, next Wednesday. Next Tuesday. Next. Not Tuesday. Wednesday. Okay, and uh, not Monday. Monday. Wednesday. Wednesday. We do Thursday. Thursday is the 28th. Um, I was going to do something, but I can do that instead. <laughs> I was going to go to a training on legal set legal issues, but we're not going to have any more legal issues, so I don't need the training. <laughs> that's, the only night. Not to go to that's the only night I have a, another meeting. Oh, really? The sister so. community next door. <laughs> Okay, so, so the twenty seven text for this meeting. <laughs> the Wednesday or the Friday night, five thirty? I can do Wednesday. Wednesday. I can't do Wednesday. Wednesday. Friday? How about the weekend? Uh, you know what? If it's at five I will just make it work if that's I'll have to make it work. 
Five thirty on you sure? Are you sure? I don't think I can do Friday. Twenty nine. I'll grovel with Tex out of the poison. <laughs> I'll so, blame Maureen. <laughs> that's okay. Thurs so, so Thursday Thursday at five thirty? Twenty eighth. On the twenty eighth. And I will send a reminder out to everyone and get it on the calendar and any member of the public can attend. Yeah. These are open to the public, so you are more than welcome to come and trail along behind us. And we're going to meet at the end of Astor Lane again? Uh, sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I didn't want to forget that, so I wanted to get that done. Now, now I will let Victoria comment on uh, non-completeness items. Um, just a couple of quick questions because sure. we have covered so much. I was just wondering, is, is there a note on the plan describing how the proposed trails would be field located? Will you be doing this based on um, a conversation with the Conservation Committee? Will they play a role? Yes, there is a note is on there? one of the plans that says okay. uh, to be coordinated with Town Planner and Conservation Commission. It's on the, on the site subdivision plan. Okay, I missed it. And then there was, it's good. Yeah, because I think that was a discussion that we had all along that it would be identified with the Maureen Conservation Commission. Um, was there a note on the plan or some wording in one of the agreements that the town of Cape Elizabeth is not responsible for the maintenance of Maxwell Woods Road? I mean, if you can't find it at this moment... Um, well, it'll be a homeowner, so in the Homeowners Association documents, those documents will, uh, they, they include provisions that the Homeowners Association is responsible for all of the maintenance uh, of the facility. Um, I can, I'll double check the notes on the plans There's, and make sure that, usually we have a note on the plan, I think that... We, we can work it out. Okay. Just make sure I, I just couldn't find it not to say um, there wasn't a note on the plate. <laughs> it's pretty fair. Um, and the status of your state approvals? Those moving along nicely? Yeah, so as I said during the presentation, we I had a conversation or traded emails actually with Christine Woodruff with some final questions, but I think she's looking to try to get a draft permit up to Augusta in the next couple of weeks to okay. uh, complete the permitting. So. That's really the only permit um, that we're waiting on. Okay. So I, I'm hopeful that by the time we come back for final approval, we would have that permit in hand. Um, when we were talking about the affordable units, um, I do want you to keep in mind that um, please don't put them in a cluster, like um, you said two or three, 27 or 28. I, I don't want to see something like two and three become your affordable sure. units. You, you understand, right? Yeah, so, what we were trying, actually I was trying to do, I was trying to give them some flexibility that, mm -hmm. you know, it could, it could be one or those two and then one or these two over here so they're separated. But I, actually I didn't realize that, but I think the way the ordinance is written, they, they have to be separate. And, they do. You know, if, if I'll talk to Joel if if it comes, if the board is agreeable that they could come back between Peter and the chair for a de minimis change, I could, we could tie it down to maybe two specific units, make sure they're separated on the plan now, and then as Joel depends on how the development happens, you know, maybe he ends up putting one way down at the end and one way up at the top, but they wouldn't be yeah. next to each other. Okay. Um, you, um, you said that Joel has a document for the affordable housing units. Um, who drafted that document? Not Joel. Was it an attorney? Well, I have to look to Maureen because that was, was it, created, was that was created for when Eastman when, Meadows was... When, yeah, when the town adopted the affordable housing provisions in 1992, um, in an effort to encourage developers to meet the requirements, the town adopted a permanent affordable housing agreement exactly. that we found acceptable, and developers aren't required to use that. They have to provide an agreement, but that one is one that is already ready to go. So that is the one that's used. Um, actually, um, Joel Fitzpatrick, uh, his attorney made some suggestions for some amendments to it, just before the Eastman Meadows uh, units were sold, and 
Um, our, our attorney and Joe's attorney basically just made some improvements to that document, but it is, in my opinion, stood the test of time. It's, okay. it's the same document we've used as units have been sold and they're still remaining affordable. I was hoping it was the town's document. I, I, I misheard. I thought I heard it's, that. Joel. It's the town's document, but but okay. it's been there's been input from developers, and but it is our document. We'll include a, a copy of that. I can in the final plans. The yeah, that's the one sure. that wasn't in here. Yeah. I, I, just a reminder: how many bedrooms were the condo units? Are they typically yeah. two or three? I, I forget. I've looked at so many. I think there. Anyone remember? I think I'm just going to ask. There's Usually, two. there's two with an optional den or a sunroom. Yeah, yeah there are two they, bedrooms. Yeah, there could. I suppose one of those optional dens or sunrooms could be a third bedroom. But most of these units have, you know, are, are occupied by a couple, an older couple or individual, and then they have a guest room and then a sunroom and a patio. Okay, so they they typically two. Um, I, I brought my little chart tonight on um, HUD income limits. Victoria, and, yeah. excuse me. Do you have many more? I just no, want to. This is it. I just want to move this along. No, we have a lot it. more to do. This is it. No, I'm just glad to see that um, these will be affordable. If it was a couple moving in there at fifty-two thousand dollars, that would be their income limit. That was it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions for Owens? We'll have plenty on the sidewalk. I know. I know. So. Okay. We have another motion to do. Motion, Go ahead. motion to table uh, with public hearing. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joel Fitzpatrick doing business as Maxwell Woods LLC for final subdivision review, a resource protection permit, and site plan review of the Maxwell Woods development, including 38 condominium units and eight apartments in two buildings and amendments to previously approved Spurwink Woods subdivision related to the road extension. The table to the regular October 17, 2017 meeting of the planning board at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Thank you. Any comment? All those in favor? Opposed? No one? Unanimous. All right. Now, now, now I can go. go. Okay. <laughs> Have a good evening, all. Thank you. We have, we have more people from there? I don't know. <laughs> if you don't want to see Next item on the agenda is Comfy Cape Expansion Site Plan Amendment. Kimberly Scholl is requesting amendment to the previously approved site plan to expand the Comfy Cape daycare from 19 to 40 children located at 111 Scott Dyer Road, Section 19-9 Site Plan. We will be reviewing for completeness. And while they're getting ready, I'll just, in case somebody has come in in the interim, just remind people that we will not be discussing 75 Ocean House Road or 287 Ocean House Road this evening. They've been moved to a future. They are submitting for future meetings. Want me to sing? I know that.
that's required in here. Showing your screen. Is it working? Technical difficulties. Okay, um, sorry about the delay. I'm Kimberly Schull, the owner of Comfy Keep Child Care. I'm a mother of three. I've been a registered nurse for 18 years, specializing in pediatrics. I'm also a prior business owner. There is a great need for child care across the state of Maine. According to Catholic, Kathy Paglio, child care licensing specialist at DHHS, um, she speaks about the great need for child care um, in specifically in Cumberland County. Before purchasing the business, um, I also found that in my research and speaking with other child care facilities in Cape Elizabeth that also have wait lists for child care. Comfy Cape has always had a perpetual wait list of 15 plus families, often waiting six to 12 months for a place at our child care facility. My business plan to increase the enrollment at Comfy Cape would be a great as asset to the townspeople in Cape Elizabeth. Um, for my slideshow, I have a few pictures of the property. For those of you who haven't seen, um, that, that's the building. Currently, Comfy Cape is occupying the first floor. That's the side entrance the parents use. And the upper level is, um, I have tenants living up there. The next picture is just showing the side entrance for the families and the side view of the property facing the parking lot. This slide is showing one view of the um, playground that's located behind the building. Here's another view of the playground. This is a picture of the um, old fruit, fruit tree that was cited um, to be trimmed in the traffic study report. Um, here's a picture 
when you're entering the property and you can see the large grassy field over here to the left. Um, my proposed additional fenced in play yard is right in this area here, you can see. The, abut the abutter's property is, kind of goes like back. The line is back in that area. And then I just have pictures, I zoomed it in, of the site plan. Okay, so as far as I'm discussing the completeness of my application, the items that I wanted to address tonight, the um, submission A, the evidence of right title and interest in the property, I will provide um, a relationship documenting the deed is listed as Kimberly Sunshine Properties LLC as the owner and that's the LLC that I formed when buying the property. So I can provide um, the certificate of formation for the LLC establishing the relationship. For the lighting, the I had provided, provided a photometric plan. I can provide a larger copy of the photometric plan so it can be more e easily readable. And I also have a slide showing it here, and there was a question for the photometric study they had recommended one light installed on this left side of the building at a feet of 18 feet on the building to provide this um, lighting study, and that's a picture of the light that would be used. And then for noise, um, I will provide the um, anticipated decibel levels at the property line. In my plan, I also had um, discussed um, the staggered um, play times outside. And then I can also address the items that were um, recommended by um, Stephen Harding, the town engineer, in his letter. Um, the topography, um, he recommended, um, I can utilize the town's GIS data, so I will provide the contours for the topography. And for erosion control, he, um, I can provide, I've had Atlantic Resource Consultants review um, my application, and a civil engineer there can fulfill the requirements for the erosion control measures, so I will provide that. They will also be able to um, put on the engineer stamp that was requested, the graphic scale, and the number four. Garin Turgeon, the architects, will add the handicap van accessible parking space. The Atlantic Resource Consultant Civil Engineer will add number five, the typical parking lot section. I will provide that, and also the pavement saw cut. And I had a question about with this the size of me increasing the parking lot, it was 1,100 square feet. If there was a town ordinance that makes that requirement, these additional requirements with the parking lot section detail and the pavement saw cut, when is that normally required? For like, I was just wondering for a project of this size, if that's always required or if- Always. It's always required, okay. So I will provide those. 
and then I also provide the fence detail. Um, I can do that through a picture of my proposed um, fence. Oops. Okay. A picture and also the materials and measurements. And I do want to point out I'm not sure why, but that the proposed play yard is was just a um, a fenced a fence around a grassy area. It's not going to look like the play yard that I showed the pictures of. There'll be no structures on it. It's just more like a fr a free space for children um, to play, do group activities. So there would be no wood chips, um, no structures just more open, closed in area. But it's in that shape, right? A rectangle? Yes, yes, yes. The shape of the rectangle and that amount of square footage. But when you look at the property, you would just see like a you know, fenced in you know rectangular area. Fences? Well, the fence that I currently have on the other playground is a f um, four foot picket fence. So my original plan was to match that fence. You all set? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to open. Um, for public comment on completeness of this application, if anyone would like to speak, please state your name, your address, and, uh, key, and li try to limit your comments to three minutes, please. So we will be going to the mic, right? Yes. You may want to leave your, okay, your just application like open just, just in case. <laughs> right. I'm not sure why we're not seeing it anymore. Uh, that's okay. So, yeah, yeah, we'll get it. We'll get it back if we need it. What? Well, we'll we'll deal with it at that time. So everyone's gonna have to be careful. Yeah. So. All right. Hi, my name is Blake Strack. I live at uh, my my family and I live at uh, have a house at uh, 19 Patricia Drive. And so my understanding is that our public comment tonight are limited to the completeness of the site plan amendment and expansion application, which is really what it is. Um, and Maureen's memo, which is publicly available, addressed many of the missing components of the application, which I'm not quite clear whether those were actually addressed in that presentation or not. But I would like to take issue with one aspect of Maureen's memo, which is the assertion that the traffic assessment requirement has been met. Um, <laughs> Here's why. The traffic assessment was completed on August 8th, so not when school was in session. And it was completed and provides numbers for the PM only, not, no AM numbers were provided. So those two factors alone render the traffic study inadequate and irrelevant. Uh, the current traffic study, based on when it was done, can't take into account important factors that profoundly affect traffic flow and safety in the neighborhood of the comfy Cape daycare. These factors are increased traffic during the hour before school drop-off and after school release, the AM hour before school, especially is exactly when the uh, daycare's drop-off traffic will peak as a result of the expansion. Um, school bus, there's a school bus stop right there in front of Cape Memory Care. So that affects the traffic flow. It wouldn't have been reflected in any summer assessment. There's an increase in traffic volume caused by a high volume of local parents driving their kids to school. This, the importance of this cannot be overstated. Um, Scott Dyer is the primary feeder road 
to the school from that entire side of Cape Elizabeth. Um, and there will be an increase in pedestrian and bike traffic of kids going to school, which includes our kids in the neighborhood. That's really important to take into account. That traffic study was virtually worthless. These concerns are legitimate and should be taken into account. I hope you'll do so by requiring another traffic study conducted during the school year for both AM and PM. On a personal note, my family chose to move to buy property and move to Cape Elizabeth when we moved back from another state because of the walkability and livability of this particular part of Cape Elizabeth. In buying our property, we sought and found the same features that we've sought and found in two states and two other cities. We got property within walking distance to school. We got traffic safety and a cozy neighborhood feeling provided by a dead-end non-through street and the proximity to the town center. This expansion plan would change the very nature of our neighborhood and the safety of our children. I encourage you to reject the application at this point as incomplete. And on a personal note, my opinion is that this process feels to me, and I apologize for this, but it's my opinion, like the planning board is really only interested in checking off boxes that are prerequisite to approval of the expansion plan. That if you, if the application eventually meets the zoning requirements, that this will inevitably be approved as the last one was in 2009. So, all right. Thank you. Excuse me, I didn't get your name. Blake Strack, STR, ACK, 19 Patricia Drive. Hello, my name is Dr. Michelle Schwab. I live at 6 Patricia Drive. I've lived there for nine years. I've raised two children there. I moved in just at the time the uh, last expansion occurred. So the way it is now has been my norm. Um, my house, I bought my house for many of the same reasons that Blake did. I bought a dead end street with a tight neighborhood feeling with lots of kids and it was quiet. And I was very worried about that because Scott Dyer is very busy. Um, I now work from home more often than in the office. During the summer, that was a non-issue. During the spring and the fall, my office is on the side of the house that backs against the property. There's, there's a property, I don't have a diagram to show you. Two Patricia is right behind me, and the piece of property we're discussing is right next to that. So I hear those kids playing outside every day that they're out there, a couple times a day, and my work as a psychologist and a disability consultant stops until the playground time is over. I can live with that. The idea of increasing that by 100% to another 20 kids is appalling to me. It's interfering greatly with my quality of life. And I can assure you that when I was house hunting, nine years ago, if I was driving to view a property that had 10 parking places, an enclosed play area, another play area, I would not buy my house and I have significant concerns. I know this isn't your concern. I have concerns about the future value of my property because of increased commercialization. Cape Memory Care was not built when I moved in. Um, that's a relatively quiet business, as you know, given the nature of it. Um, there aren't a tremendous amount of cars coming and going. My kids are now in high school and college. But it wasn't too long ago when we had to raise heck with the school to give us a bus stop so that our kids didn't have to walk without sidewalks down the street to Wainwright to get a bus ride to school. We still don't have a crosswalk. 
and now we have cars coming and going at the same time people are leaving for work. I cannot see logically how it can be argued that this is not going to increase traffic. And I know for sure I don't care about, I don't know about things like decibels. I'd encourage, I'd welcome you to come sit in my home office during recess and tell me if you could concentrate. As it, recess as it exists now with 20 kids. My kids went to Apple Tree. I'm a big believer in K businesses. I think that having an expansion like this in a quiet residential area is really inappropriate. Thank you. help him through this because he's no, older but he's, he's still a better public speaker than me so I'm going to let him. Okay. My name is Michael Bowdler. My son and I own the property directly next door to this business. So we're uh, in a very vulnerable position. Um, I understand I've got three minutes. Right? Yes, please. Um, it took me three minutes to get to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't count as part of your three minutes. Um, okay. Um, uh, I agree with the restriction on the timing because I've attended planning boards when the people have drawn on. But I think my record with the planning board is have been very uh, brief. brief. Uh, but we, a group of us, neighbours and, and, and us feel very vehemently opposed to this proposal to expand this business. So we are probably going to present our case in very vehement terms. But we don't want to, um, to have that mistake as any disrespect to the planning board. For the last 25 years, I've had several issues with the planning board and I can say that I've been, well, I and we have been treated very fairly and very intelligently by both your town planner and the planning board. But we do feel very strongly on this issue so that in our case uh, we're going to present our case in very strong terms. Now, in the essence of being brief, perhaps I should quote, oh, I think this is demonstrated in our effort to present our case to the board on one page instead of 20 pages. Um, in the essence of being brief, maybe I should just quote a clause from uh, our letter to the planning board which we want to consolidate, precipitate and consolidate with the public and with the board. And that is that considering what happened in 2008, the town approved this business's uh, application to expand uh, and favouring that business over the objections of numerous neighbours Considering that, we feel that at this point in time, it would be a balancing, equitable application of jurisdiction. I'll repeat that. It'll be a, it would be a, a balancing, equitable application of jurisdiction for the town to now tell this business that in for any further ambitions to expand their occupancy, they should be seeking another site that is not as blatantly overpowering to a neighbour. Otherwise, what is the point in having zoning in the first place? Anyone living in Cape Elizabeth should be entitled to uh, depend on the peaceful environment around his home and that same uh, resident 
looks to zoning and to the planning board to guarantee that tranquility. Again, if that guarantee isn't there, what is the point of zoning? If I were to, supposing they get the OK, and I were to apply to the planning board for permission to open up a fish and chip shop on Patricia Drive, and claim that the fish and chip shop creates far less noise than the daycare centre, what would be the planning board's reaction? You tell me to go and take a walk. Okay. I'm going to ask you okay. to wrap up. Now, um, the um, applicant... She's asking you to speed it up, finish it up. Finish it up. You're over your three minutes, so please finish up. Three minutes? You're done, yeah. yeah. Oh. Could you... Well, I'm representing a bunch of neighbours, say, at least four, that's five of us. Five times three, 15 minutes. <laughs> I, I, I feel that that hasn't, hasn't given the point of view in any way near the volume to represent our view. If you'd like me to continue for another three minutes, I'd like to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jim Mooney. I live at 3 Patricia Drive. I have lived there for 46 years. I've seen this neighborhood go through many, many changes. Little kids growing up getting married. Uh, and it's always been a very peaceful, quiet neighborhood. Then the daycare came, the home daycare as it started out. I believe it was 11 children. It changed the neighborhood, but not drastically. We could live with it. Then it went to 19. We had reservations at the time, and our fears were realized. It became much more noisy. Not all the time, but at times it was really, in fact, two years ago there was one child there that could, uh, had a decibel rating that could break glass. Now, you know, this happens all the time. There's little kids that come through the system, some of them are really noisy. They do grow up, they become quiet, but they get replaced by the noisy ones. And this has been going on now for quite a few years. Now they're saying they're going to go up to 40 kids. This is a, a residential neighborhood. And all of a sudden, the home daycare became a LLC business that's based out of Scarborough. And I guess the owner lives in, in out of state. Uh, I just hope that the, the board will realize what this is, would do to this neighborhood. It is not just the noise either, it will be the traffic. The amount of spaces they have for parking, and if they have even 30 people showing up in the morning to drop off their kids, there's not gonna be room for it. So I hope, and I can't even imagine what the noise is next door to, uh, to. I'm 150 feet away, and it's, <laughs> it's bad at my house. So I hope the board will realize that this would change this neighborhood drastically. It's already been changed, but at least not to the extent that this would be with 40 kids. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chip Brewer, and I live at 11 Patricia Drive with my family. Uh, I, uh, with respect to the completeness of the application, I, I, or the, the permit, whatever it is. Uh, I have concerns about the traffic study, as Blake mentioned earlier. I feel like um, that's not an adequate representation of the level of traffic on Scott Dyer Road, particularly in the AM and PM when the buses are going by and people are going to and from work. Uh, I also have a question for you. Uh, there were a number of items that where the applicant said that, uh, that things would be provided. Um, since they're not here or have not been provided yet, can it, it seems to me it would then be deemed incomplete as of this evening. Is that? Accurate, we'll see. I guess we'll see. Well, it seems to me if the things aren't here, then it isn't complete in another 
I, I can't say yes or no because we haven't voted yet. Fair so. enough. It seems like it's a fait accompli. <laughs> if the information isn't here, you would then be voting that you hope that the information arrives, right? Um, and then finally, on a broader level, uh, I have grave concerns as a, a neighbor that we're going to have a business that has um, 50 people, so 40 kids and then six to eight uh, employees, I would guess, taking care of those kids. And that's a 50 person business, which uh, has 10 parking spots, and I think that's probably as many parking spots as there are up at the Cumberland Farms, and that's a pretty busy place. Obviously, this is not Cumberland Farms, but a uh, 50 person business at the end of my street is not really uh, in conjunction with the, the residential neighbor, uh, residential nature of the neighborhood. So, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Becky Brosnan. I live at 7 Patricia Drive. Um, I've lived on the street for three years, and so the daycare has been there in its current form for as long as I've lived in the neighborhood, and I've honestly never had any issues or complaints with them. Um, it certainly gets noisy at certain times of the day, but I also have two young children, and I know kids make noise, and I think everybody on the street kind of accepts that for what it is. Um, in terms of the completeness of the application, I have concerns about the um, stormwater component that I don't know was addressed directly. Um, our neighborhood has wetlands um, in very close proximity, and a lot of the yards, including mine, flood uh, during heavy rainstorms. And so an increase of this uh, amount of impervious surface seems like um, a big issue could be flooding, um, and I don't want it to impact neighboring properties or Scott Dyer Road or the um, Little Creek wetland um, that runs adjacent to this property. I would hate to see stormwater impacts to that natural area that is part of the character of our neighborhood. Um, in addition to that, uh, my, my two young children, one is in uh, elementary school and one goes to another daycare in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I recognize that there's a big need for um, child care in this area. I've been on wait lists. I've been stressed out about those types of issues. And so I don't want to discourage that type of um, business in general. But if the quality of life or property values on my street go down as a result of this pretty drastic change in the nature of the business, I would be unsupportive of that type of change. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, I'm going to close the public comment period and open it up for the board. Anybody want to start us off? Can I just ask the applicant a quick question? You certainly may. Even though we don't get into the building design at all, you've been to the state fire marshal with yes. your plan and layout, and they're blasted. Kim, could you come back to the podium? Yes, I did have a meeting in Augusta um, with the state fire marshal um, to discuss the plan of the, and the layout of the building, and we discussed um, what fire measures would be needed um, to, if I were to increase the enrollment. Okay. Yes. You have ar your architects drawing up plans to make those improvements? Um, I've had um, two different um, providers for fire alarm systems um, and sprinkler systems um, visit the property and um, write, write up plans that fulfill their requirements. Right, I start at the town, and then once I get approval for the number of children here, then I make application for the state to increase the number of my license. That will prompt the fire marshal inspection once again, and they come before I would get a new license. Okay, great. Thank you. Go ahead, Jonathan. Um, this, I don't think this is directed specifically towards you, but I have concerns with regards to the traffic study also. I remember when we looked at the application for the Hillway project. We specifically uh, asked for a traffic study to be done during the school months because that's such a popular road uh, for people bringing their students. And so when I look at your traffic study, um, that specifically mentions the road, the travel of the road of Scott Dyer during August. I don't think that's representative of 
uh, how much traffic that road gets um, with regards to school. Um, so I have concerns about, I don't know if this traffic study is going to be the actual data that we're going to need to make a decision. Peter. I uh, had the same concern in the traffic study. Uh, furthermore, I'd, when I first saw this application, the idea of people being worried about kids making too much noise struck me as a little unusual, but there seems to be quite a, a number of the neighbors who are uh, concerned about it, and the submission by the applicant based on a, uh, a looks like a photocopy of a study done in England uh, seems to me a little bit inadequate where you do now have the opportunity to study the sound effects by 20 kids or you know half the number you're proposing to expand it to would give some real real-time data and then would also give you a chance perhaps to find ways to baffle the sound being by, uh, made by the kids when they're outdoors you can sometimes put sound baffling um, uh, fixtures onto the fencing to reduce the, uh, the carry of the voices. So I, I would be looking, I think, for a more robust uh, evaluation of the uh, noise factor. Henry? I don't know whether you want to do Microphone? Sorry. I don't know whether you answered this with uh, Peter's question. But if you're ex proposing to expand the number of children to the level of that, have you thought about how many fire exits need to be altered or increased by in whether they're whether they're high up or ground level be, and whether they can window if you're proposing windows whether they're large enough to accept children to go through as there's a minimum size for the window for that um, and I didn't see it in this whether whether that's you know right those requirements um, are handled by the fire marshal's office. Before I got my license, yes, but when I got the business this time, you mean as far as the expansion for the second floor? Because yeah, the, well, the first floor is adequate. If you double the number of children, you double the number, the time to get them out of the building. Right. Which means that, you know, if a particular window is all right for four, you may need two windows for eight. So it's the half the time to be able to get them out. So I'm just wondering if that study has been done or if you've considered that. I didn't see it in here. Maybe it's in, maybe I missed I, it. I have looked up online the State Fire Marshal's office. There is under a child care facility. There are all the regulations with which what is required for the building as far as fire marshals, as far as fire measures, the sprinkler, fire alarm system, and then two exits from each room that the children are in. So I have looked at all that and discussed it with um, the fire marshal that's assigned to Comfy Cape when I purchased the business and she did an inspection. I also dis I discussed that with her. Um, to, to the number of students you currently got. And also a proposed plan to increase the number, what the additional measures would be. Okay, if yes. you've done that. Thanks. Yes. Did, did you mention it in this report? I, I, I didn't mention I it in there. Um, I didn't realize it was a requirement at the town level because I thought that was that's a requirement to get my state my, to get my license at the state level. But I can provide that information if you would like to review it. Okay, thank you. Johnson, there was something mentioned in your materials about staggering the times that you were going to have children go out. Um, I don't know if you want to tell us more about it, or maybe you could submit something to us with regards to that, so we know. Um, if right now you have 19 children uh, and all of them go out at the same time, I'm sure that's not how it works, but um, if we could get sort of the change that might occur if this application mm -hmm. is approved, um, if you now have 10 children going out, does that mean that there's going to be uh, three different times that 10 children are going to be going out, or does that mean that there's going to be 20 children going to be out at one time? Uh, I think that would give us more information uh, for how if this change is allowed, uh, would actually have an effect on the neighbors. Because I'm familiar with Patricia Drive, and I know how close in proximity that is to that, to your mm -hmm. business. So I want to make sure that everybody is uh, protected on this. Victoria? 
Um, I am ready to vote on completeness um, with the caveat that um, if you don't provide the information that is missing, I will vote no on this and right now, <laughs> I'm telling you. So I am willing to go forward because of the, um, and then so I can have um, a real discussion on some of the other questions that I have. Um, I, I'm actually not ready to go forward on completeness. I have concerns about the traffic study. I have concerns about, uh, you know, evidence evidence of right title inter interest, you know, providing something later, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, erosion, an erosion plan, an erosion control plan, I have a concern that that's not included. Um, so those two things uh, really make me question completeness on this. Am and I able to comment? The am I able to comment on the traffic study? Um, there was confusion that there wasn't a um, peak traffic data provided, but that was included in the study. You should have the reports of the AM peak traffic count and PM peak traffic count. And I, I think the concern on the traffic study isn't so much the, the AM and PM, it's the time of year the in which it was done. And then it was also documented in the traffic study that um, the months of July and August are representative of tre peak travel conditions. I know neighbors have argued against that. I would argue with that. And then <laughs> also um, the town engineer, um, Stephen Harding, also commented on that. Um, I would disagree with him too. I would disagree with him. Okay. He also had said that he thought it was um, repre representative of an adequate time. Yeah. I, yeah. I would disagree with that. So um, July and August are Jonathan the key um, tourist times in Cape Elizabeth. Lots of yeah, people but, traveling for different, yeah, you know, Yeah, Scott Dyer reasons. Road's not a tourist road. They're all on Route 77. So um, I really, I really strongly disagree that uh, that July and August are representative of Scott Dyer Road travel. And for the same reason that Jonathan mentioned, when we did another project, we asked them to do it during the school year because of its location and its proximity to the schools. Yes, at the planning board workshop, it was not um, requested yeah. a specific time for the traffic study to be done, so I incurred the cost of $1,800 to have the first traffic study done. I will let you be aware of that. And I did want to comment on the erosion control. I did say in my presentation earlier that um, the civil engineer is able to provide that information for me. Yep, that doesn't mean you can't bring this back again if we deem it, if, and I could be the only one mm -hmm. uh, if we were to deem it incomplete tonight. That doesn't mean you can't bring it back again with more complete information. That, that's right. not a problem. I, just, in, and I apologize to you that if you did incur that cost, I, um, but at the same time, I, I, when school starts, I know that it's going to take me longer to get to work because I have to travel on Scott Dyer as opposed to July and August. So I, I also disagree with the town engineer that uh, July and August are representative of uh, peak travel times. We could get a traffic study that says, yeah, September, October, that's kind of the same thing. And at least we could see that data and make a decision on that. But um, that's my concern when it comes to the, uh, uh, to the traffic study. And I think that's the most important um, to me that I would, I don't think this would be complete. So particularly just um, reworking, redoing the traffic numbers for peak AM and PM travel times just on the traffic on Scott Dyer Road because the traffic in and out of the daycare would be unchanged with the same amount of enrolled children. So I don't understand why that would have to be redone. And then also his data to make the 10 parking spaces adequate. Well, what I see is that there are the summary from the traffic study is that the proposed 21 student expansion is going to be expected to generate 17 additional vehicle trips in the morning and 17 additional trips in the afternoon peak hours. Um, that then goes into... And just remember, the 17 trips, a, a, um, a family coming in to our parking lot is one trip. They pick up their child and they leave. That's two trips. So 17 trips is actually eight and a half cars coming and going. And See, so it could be confusing to think that 17 cars are coming and 
you know, in the peak morning hours, just so you're aware of that. Okay. Um, but then it goes on to in, in point number three, um, the traffic data shows that approximately 195 vehicles travel Scott Dyer Road during the morning peak hours, um, and then nearly 250 in the afternoon peak hours. They refer to peak hours between July and August. I think that number is most likely increased if it goes into the uh, school year. So I would like to be able to see that. If it turns out it's not that big of an increase, then that might change my mind that it's important. But when I see July and August as the time that this traffic study was done, um, I know personally from living in town that uh, I don't think that is representative of uh, the travel on Scott Dyer. Okay. Um, based on based on me starting this this off, I'm going to poll the the group on their position on completeness. So, Jonathan, I'm saying it's incomplete at this time. Victoria, I say complete because I wanted to talk about some other issues. <laughs> and then, yeah. Anyways. Do you want to say incomplete? Incomplete. 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 So. So we need to give her some direction on, on why we think it's incomplete. Just And for me, it's primarily the traffic study, but the other things that you mentioned that you would provide would also, you know, a, a future submission would also be more detailed. And so, yeah. I'm hearing issues around noise. Noise, and yep. We, we have heard from um, uh, applicants tonight that had to deal with noise issues. There was a generator, and they did say there are ways you can baffle noise. Um, I understand that you don't want to put the children in their um, rectangular areas behind um, six foot tall with baffling. I understand that, but you do have a back area that looks like there is no fencing back there. There might be ideas around um, a taller fence than four feet, um, a, a thicker fence instead of pickets, and then possibly using ideas that are available and are out there around um, solid materials that can baffle. Um, it's a solid that'll baffle, not the trees. They, they don't tend to, they'll obscure view, but they don't tend to stop noise. But um, the concerns I'm hearing from the neighbors do have to do with the traffic, do have to do with the noise. So I would say um, you may want to look at noise issues. Okay. Yeah, with me, it's noise also and uh, the traffic. It's incumbent on us to do our due diligence. And I think the information submitted is not like the, I'm reiterating what's already been said, but the noise and the traffic. I think, I think the noise, oh, sorry. Oh. I might need it's all right, as I'm getting older, I keep forgetting things. Uh, uh, for me, it, it would be the noise, but also uh, I would like to see something about the safety issue of exit in case of emergency. Okay. It just, you know, something from some authority that says, yes, it's adequate, and it would be adequate for these number of children. Okay. Yeah, Maury. I, I guess I want to ask the board, and I understand Mr. Steinberg always raises these issues, and then I always have to say, these are usually code enforcement issues. They're building code issues, and we usually try to stay out of the code enforcement officer's job, and he tries not to tell us how to do planning. So do we really want to get into building code issues or do we want to rely on the code officer and the fire marshal to do their job? Well, I know the fire marshal will, will do it. I know the fire marshal will eventually be called in to look at it regardless of what we said. But I, you know, it's like the traffic study, you did it possibly at the wrong time of the, of the year or time, so I'm just raising that as a point of possibly that you should look into before they, we go any further. can't get a permit in order to operate the business without the approval of a fire marshal. I understand that. So, and also, yes, yes. So so. The, but it, it's something the fire that marshal and the code enforcement officer will be doing that job. And um, Peter. Yeah, I, uh, traffic and noise, as previously discussed, I also 
Uh, the comment made by Sebago on the uh, downslope erosion control, I, I think, should be done. There's a substantial wetland right off the uh, property. And as you look at the noise thing, you may want to be considering where in that uh, grassy area the thing might best be placed. It might come f closer to the road. It might be way, you know, to the back of the property line. So knowing where that thing is going to go, I think we'll have something to do with uh, the erosion control. Morning. Is there a setback on where the play area can be? There isn't because it's a yard, and you can put, you know, it's like anyone. You have your yard, and you can put a fence up in your yard because a fence isn't considered a structure that we regulate. So there's plenty of room for that to float wherever it's going to be. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Do I have a motion? Go ahead, Peter. Um, motion for completeness, <coughs> excuse me, motion for the board to consider, motion for completeness. Be it order that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Kimberly Scholl for an amendment to the previously approved site plan for 111 Scott Dyer Road to expand the existing daycare from 19 to 40 children be deemed incomplete. A second, Jim. All right, Jim. Jim. I saw him first. Okay. <laughs> All, right. All those in favor? Opposed? Yeah, we're not opposed. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda. Is Last item on the agenda. Is the applicant here? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Right now we are going to deal with one 1226 Shore Road office retail apartment building site plan amendments. 1226 Shore Road LLC is requesting an amendment to a previously approved site plan to expand the existing building to accommodate office retail and eight apartments section 19-9 site plan completeness before you go i just need to make one quick announcement um so catherine here works with archetype which is a firm i've been associated with for a long time and um, i haven't worked with them recently and i don't think there's any conflict with me uh, reviewing this but I just want to throw it out there I'm fine with you reviewing I'm fine with it okay. Joe could you explain the nature of your relationship with the firm you said you've been associated with them in some yeah fashion. so I when I first moved here I worked there full-time and then I uh, worked as a consultant on and off on various projects continuing to present day Hmm? Continuing to the present day, or is this in the past? Uh, it, well, I kind of screwed up a project a couple years back, and he hasn't <laughs> hired me since. So. Well, in our shucks, all erases a hundred atom boys. Victoria, um, I had um, a question. Um, is there a Mr. Tinsman um, associated with this project? Yes. Okay, um, I have a professional working relationship with Mr. Tinsman, and I would like to recuse myself. I don't know if we have to vote on that, or but no, no. Is that okay. Yeah. To myself? Only if you want to stay would we have to agree. Okay. I, at this time, then I am going to recuse myself All right. right out the door. Can I recuse I miss you. If you guys would like to introduce yourselves on the plan. Uh, looks like we might we might go beyond our ten o'clock time. Okay. You, you, what what the rule says is you don't start, start any new items before okay, ten p.m. without suspending the rules. <laughs> they can keep talking. They can keep talking. Just please, just please don't do too much. No. Evening, the board. My name is Steve Bushy with Stantec. With me tonight is uh, Catherine Detmere, 
Archetype Architects, and we're here on behalf of uh, 1226 Shore Road LLC, Patrick Tinsman, native Cape Elizabeth person, uh, looking to do a development here at 1226 Shore Road, basically out behind Town Hall here. We did uh, appear before you folks uh, a little while back just to give you a, an overview of what the proposal is, uh, the acquisition of the existing site, and uh, redevelopment into uh, eight units of housing with ground level retail and office space in existing building uh, that is there. So what I wanted to do, uh, because we have uh, gotten some staff comments and comments from Sebago Technics, and as I understand the process, and forgive me for not uh, having full understanding here, I haven't done anything in Cape Elizabeth for quite some time, uh, completeness seems to be the, the key piece that we're looking for tonight. We're certainly like to uh, uh, express to you uh, the things that we have on the drawings, the things that may need to be addressed moving forward. But I think uh, from our perspective, uh, we've tried to address all of those. And I'm going to show you some drawings tonight that are going to uh, show that. And many of the comments we feel were in the category of fairly minor in nature, and the broader uh, pieces of what we're proposing for the development are represented on the drawings. So bear with me if you can. I'll try to go through it quickly, recognizing the hour here that we're at. And I'm sure you're quite tired. but. Did want to just start with this first slide, which was the original survey plan. The town had owned this uh, piece of property here off of 1226 Shore Road. So here's Town Hall here. So uh, this is a plan I believe is on record with the town. The survey was done by Owen Haskell surveyors and on behalf of the town. So just to give you a sense, though, that this uh, piece of property was parceled off a while back. And frankly, I don't know the time frame. Catherine may know it a little bit better than me. Uh, when the building here was expanded and I think it was just referenced that this is more or less an amendment to a site plan when the building out front here uh, was expanded back in 2004 perhaps it was so quite a, quite a while ago I don't know uh, specifically when this when the town sold off this piece to the uh, to the landowner I'm just going to quickly buzz through a few drawings that we've now put into our plan set, but just to give you some sense that uh, the drawings that were in your packets included a site plan, utility plan, and a grading drainage and erosion control plan. We've supplemented that now to include kind of the more traditional full package. This will be a project that goes to a general contractor uh, to construct not only the building, but uh, to do site work and earthwork and so forth. So, this would be basically a you know a professional job of sorts, but the cover sheet would ultimately cover a bunch of uh, basic information, the index, uh, ownership, uh, participants who were involved with the the uh, project, and so forth. Just to give you some general sense, general notes. This was a comment from uh, Sabeo Technics about uh, notes and so forth. Basically, construction related things that uh, are important, uh, but I'm I guess on the side of feeling that, yeah, it's, it's good information, but I'm not sure uh, would necessarily be uh, involved with the idea of completeness, but we can talk about that. Here is the survey plan, and for which I need to apologize, because my application uh, referenced a uh, number of times about uh, the submittal of a survey drawing, and uh, come to find out, uh, we must have inadvertently not included this drawing, which is basically an updated survey from Owen Haskell. As I just showed you, the original survey was done by Owen Haskell some 12, 13, 14 years ago. They just updated the survey plan and to show uh, this parcel here. So 1.3 acres of land, Shore Road is located here to the north, and I may have in my uh, narrative uh, inadvertently represented north being what is really truly to the east, uh, and I apologize for that, but to the north side, here's Shore Road, and here's a private right-of-way, just so that you have an understanding. When the town, as I understand it from John Swan at Owen Haskell, conveyed the parcel, uh, they maintained a, not an even dimensioned right-of-way, but it is a reserved easement area for access. I think some 26 odd feet here, but the boundary line along this route that I'm showing doesn't run parallel with this, and I don't really know, and John couldn't give me uh, an answer uh, within the deed language and so forth. It's basically just on a drawing, and he's now recaptured that on his uh, current survey. So as I understand it, though, the reserved easement is reserved. Uh, it's a reserved easement benefiting the 
town of uh, Cape Elizabeth, and as you know, that provides access then to the parking lot and uh, recyclable area here out behind Town Hall. Existing paved area here, along with an uh, accessory building that was constructed at the rear of the property. Lawn area in here, and the existing, what I understand was a medical facility up until just most recently. Uh, operating out of the main building here. And this is going to be the, the real prime uh, um, location of the proposed activity for the residential units and then the ground level uh, mixed use of retail and the office. And Catherine will go through some nice slides showing you what the proposal is for modifying this building area. So here is the site plan and what we had included on this site plan is uh, a parking lot expansion area in this general vicinity that would include 26 parking spaces. I think, believe we have 23 ground regular open parking spaces here. There are three existing out in front. Then we're also proposing eight covered parking spaces. So basically a structure along this route for the benefit of the, the residents. We have a sidewalk that extends from Shore Road exists today out to the rear parking lot of the town hall. We'll have a couple of new curb openings. That existing paved area was served previously as a parking lot. I'm circling generally was in this area. But we're going to be modifying and reconstructing this entire area to build a new parking lot. And of particular importance, I suppose, to that is that it's going to be a porous pavement uh, surface. We have about 7,000 square feet of new impervious on the site, which isn't extremely a lot uh, given the size of the development and so forth, but uh, my recommendation to the uh, developer owner here was that a porous pavement might be a really uh, applicable and good use uh, in terms of constructing uh, a parking lot here. And from my basis, uh, the purpose for that is that would avoid a lot of uh, other infrastructure for pipes and catch basins and so forth. We could handle stormwater runoff with uh, the ability of this porous surface area to absorb the water and let it uh, leach back down on the ground. Uh, in uh, overflow events, water would necessarily discontinue off of this parking area and get into a couple of overflow catch basins that would be installed uh, certainly in here and to a point that uh, the Sebago engineers have uh, referenced the location along the existing rear building area and I'm going to show you uh, in a little bit a photograph that uh, gives you a little bit more of an idea of what's happening in this zone but uh, to Sebago's question about uh, drainage in this area I believe they're correct in that uh, maybe the addition of a catch basin structure here would be would be uh, a good uh, and worthy item to install, so we're showing that now on, on this drawing. Also note that we have a landscaping plan here and to one of the uh, uh, planner's comments about providing some quantities, uh, I'll note excuse me, the total plant quantity, some 88 plants I've added in now on this drawing to show you tonight uh, the numbers of trees and so forth that would be planted. In addition, though, we had talked about in our narrative about what, how this construction is going to lay itself out. There is a 50-foot buffer area along the east side of the site that we're going to maintain with uh, the new building placement, meaning this parking garage area, as well as the existing building and how it gets expanded and, and uh, increased in height. We want to maintain this buffer area uh, as much as practicable. But what I have said in the narrative is that there would be some tree trimming and uh, uh, pruning. There are some dead trees, a couple of dead trees, and some dead limbs and so forth. Uh, but the objective is not to uh, uh, whole heart uh, clear that area out by any stretch. We really want to preserve that as much as possible. The new plantings, uh, what we've laid out here on this plan, are hopefully uh, very close to what you'll see in the renderings here in a few minutes as well particularly around the perimeter of the new building spaces here. And again, Catherine can walk you through where the entries will be and so forth. But we do have a fair amount of new plantings. Have a few plantings in here and the plantings along the side. So a total of 88 is what we're now showing on the drawing. Uh, we have a zoning space and bulk compliance uh, table up on top. Catherine will speak to that a little bit. 
uh, but these are the general layout pieces. I know there have been some other minor comments, and again, I try to represent on this current drawing you're seeing here, not in your packet, but we feel are, are minor in nature, such as uh, the saw cut line, uh, what we would typically do here is saw cut and then do a pavement grind so that there would be a smooth transition from any new pavement that we would construct and install here for the parking lot along the existing access road. And two, one of the questions, that access road uh, is 20 foot wide. I've labeled that now, but it wasn't as clearly identified uh, in your drawing package. But it's a 20 foot wide paved uh, strip from Shore Road out into the town parking lot. The next drawing was a grading drainage and erosion control plan. I've added a few notes to it. And again, uh, to a couple of the comments from the peer reviewer, they talked about this area here as being one of importance relative to drainage. And my suggestion is that a small catch basin and pipe could get connected, and that would serve uh, to uh, relieve some drainage in here. And again, I'll show you that uh, area in a moment so you get some sense of what's happening with the grades and so forth. This plan also shows erosion control measures, and I know that one of the comments uh, related to the need to have some narrative, some discussion about erosion control. This plan did have some basic uh, material, basic information about erosion control, and we can uh, update that more uh, as needed with the peer review uh, piece of it. But in general, what we were showing was that on the downhill side of the site, we would install the typical traditional silt fence sediment barrier might be an erosion control barrier, depending on which contractor. It's, it's often, uh, uh, can be silt fence, the black fabric you see often, or it can be an erosion control mix of berm that they install on the down uh, gradient side. They would also need to install a stabilized construction entrance. They're gonna be grubbing. It's gonna be a little bit of earth moving, but generally speaking, after the first probably week of ground activity, things should be pretty buttoned up and then they start importing gravels and then your erosion potential pretty much reduces uh, quite a bit. It's really just those first few days, couple of weeks of, of activity that we have to be most cognizant of. But we've shown a stabilized construction entrance so trucks aren't dragging mud up and down uh, either the access drive here or Shore Road or the town's uh, parking lot. So that would be a, a piece there as well. And also in any catch basins they would install uh, a sediment trap during the course of construction. Long term though, I understand that the town has uh, uh, concerns and are monitored by the DEP and EPA, so uh, we added a note to that effect so that the owner as well as their contractor would be aware of the fact that, uh, you know, this is a community, an MS4 community, and there's monitoring that needs to be uh, uh, done, and it's of importance, obviously, to Cape Elizabeth that uh, there aren't any erosion control issues, so. The next plans are detail sheets, and again, uh, these are drawings that aren't, weren't, aren't, are not in your packets, but I wanted to represent to you tonight where we stood as to the, the materials and how they're going to go about ultimately, if approved, uh, constructing this project. So, you know, a lot of this uh, information is kind of just standard information, but is worthy uh, to provide to a contractor and uh, understanding how he's supposed to uh, construct things. This last page, as an example, is a lot of details on erosion control uh, information. Here is a, a more in-depth narrative, and I think this was uh, to the point that uh, the peer reviewer Sebago was offering was to provide some narrative text to the contractor to explain how it was supposed to work on the site. And finally, here is that uh, photograph of the rear building that I just wanted to get some sense. So our parking lot will be in this general area. It's over the existing pavement, but we're raising grade over this zone and as you can see here there are some short retaining walls this building finished floor elevations sits a little higher than the existing when we construct the new proposed parking lot as we've currently laid it out we would be roughly a foot foot and a half higher than here what would end up happening is from this building to our parking lot will be a gap of 10 to 12 feet and there'll need to be a swale in uh, a new catch basin structure I, I just think that we're going to end up needing to put in a little uh, bit of drainage relief out in front of this garage space uh, for any water. But generally speaking, this pavement in this zone is going to be removed and will be converted back to the lawn area 
in between the building and the porous pavement parking lot. So just to give you some sense, it was a picture taken in the morning, so I apologize for the darkness. Then here is a photometrics plan that we provided to give you some sense of uh, the lighting proposal. We have three, uh, I believe, 12 foot tall poles and then some building mounted lights out in front of the uh, parking spaces and then some building mounted lights around the perimeter with some coverages as outlined up on the top. This, this plan was prepared by Swaining Lighting out of Scarborough, so they're a professional outfit and they know the, the town's codes. Uh, the goal ultimately being obviously to have reasonable coverage for safety and security, but uh, meet town standards relative to no uh, tra light trespass and, and so forth. So uh, one of the town uh, comments, as we understand it though, uh, may be related to replacing at least three uh, existing poles that are along the access route, and uh, we can talk about that and if that needs to be updated or changed. We haven't necessarily addressed that. I will note, just going out there tonight, I think the pole that's over in this area is on. There's a pole over here that the, the light's gone. It's, the base is still there, but the pole probably got clipped off with snow plow or something. And then there's another pole o over in this zone that's just the light bulb must be out or, or broken. So um, certainly amenable to discussing that further with new lights if that's necessary to be more up to date with what the town standard wants to be, and we can talk talk that through. And here's just a little image of the lighting pieces, and I think we're going to get on to plans now that Catherine will kindly walk you through. I was actually just going to talk you through these lighting pictures quickly before I transition into the next piece. Um, it was commented that the pole lights proposed should be in keeping with the town center style. Photos aren't showing up very well here, but this is the town center style down here. This is the proposed LED pole light for the parking lot. I believe there are three of them. Um, so we do think that's in keeping. It's got full cutoff around the LED. Uh, we have several wall-mounted fixtures. There's just one at an entrance and then a few on the garage bays. This is what we're proposing right now. We like this fixture. It's a little bit more of a contemporary feel, but it still ties back in with historic and residential feels that are going on around it. And then finally, we're using recessed cans. We have canopies and roofs over our decks and entrances. And rather than having a prominent fixture, we'd like to actually make an area that glows so you don't see the fixture itself. So in terms of the building, um, we have Shore Road up at the top here, and we have the access road down here. This is a preliminary first floor plan, but I wanted to show you how the uh, entrances work in terms of that. You come in off of Shore Road and you have your major entrance from that side of the building and that's going to lead into a corridor that you can go all the way through the building to the major entrance from the parking. So those are the two yellow arrows. Then we have that divided into three spaces. We have two office spaces, a larger one over here that's along the neighboring residential zone and then we have a smaller one in the corner here and then finally up at the corner of the access road in Shore we have our retail space. Um, so. We actually have exterior entrances for that retail space on the access road, it has its own. And then the larger of the two office spaces would have an exterior entrance from the parking lot. The smaller you would access from that corridor and then the residential above, you can go into the corridor, get into the, co or the apartment lobby and then go into an elevator or stairwell and then they have a secondary entrance back here. Um, I do want to point out that this wing of the building, this is actually an existing footprint that we're working with and we're growing in certain areas, but we like the fact that this wing of the building protrudes forward and helps to make more of a division between the retail component and the neighboring residential. If you go upstairs, we've got four units, four apartments per floor for two floors for a total of eight. These are two bedroom units that we're showing. Each has a deck. And then um, in terms of how we grew the building, we added right here, in between the two wings and we added back at this corner and what we were aiming to do was make a building that was thick enough through the middle to have a corridor with enough space on both sides to make a deep enough unit that it's really livable so that's what drove the additions and then in terms of the square footage we calculated the parking based on this and there are some there's a slight adjustment from what you have in your packet i have recalculated the square footage to reach to the exterior face of the um, exterior wall based on the definitions in your zoning. 
So for the building A, I call the large building that we're working on building A, we have our eight units with our required 1.7 spaces for each two bedroom unit, taking us to 14 spaces for those two floors. On the first floor, we have a little under 3,500 square feet of office, five per thousand, so that takes you to 17 spaces. And then we have our retail component, which is three per thousand plus staff. So with um, a little over 800, that gets us to five spaces, which is a total of 36 spaces. As Steve mentioned, we have 26 standard and eight garage spaces. The garages, one goes to each unit above, but we have 34 spaces, we need 36, so what we are asking is if we can have two shared spaces. And with the uses in this building, that would work nicely. Um, there would be two spots that could be daytime use for office and then nighttime use for residential, and that would mean that all of the residential would have two cars, um, which may not actually be likely. In terms of building B, I looked at the kind of worst case scenario in terms of parking requirements. That's a first floor open space with a mezzanine above. Right now it's planned to be office space downstairs and storage upstairs, but I ran the whole square footage as office and that got us to five required spaces, which if you lay that out, you have easily enough room for your three exterior spaces and then your two spaces within the garage base. Next, I'm going on to signage. This is one of the items on completeness. Uh, first, I wanna show that we have an existing uh, freestanding sign out front. The location is to remain the same. It's a wood sign, we wanna keep it wood. The current one is six and a half feet tall. We'd like to go up to seven, but we're allowed to go up to 15, so we're well within the standards. We don't have the full design, but we would remain within the 20 square feet allowable per side of that freestanding. And then we just noted other areas where walls, where signage would go in potentially. At the major entrance to the corridor, we'd like to put a smaller wall sign, possibly two feet by three feet, made out of metal that would just denote the um, occupancies inside so you know what you could access from that door. There's a nice canopy over the office space here, possible on inside the signage, but this would be something worked out between the tenant and code enforcement when they came in and then possible window signage on the retail because you'll see they have a lot of glazing. So we were just looking through the allowable signages and there's one for each of these, but we did note in the bottom that the total square footage of signage would not exceed the 75 square feet allowed. You guys have any lighting on that sign on Shore Road? I have not been told that we are, but I can ask that and find out. Well, we are just, I think we need to okay. know that. That'd be something we would add. So when you look at where the building is located, it's a pretty important site and the fact that we're right here on Shore Road bordering between the spaced out residential and then the town center. So that plays into the uses that we're um, saying that we would like to have in this building with the mixed use. The first floor with the medical office spaces or office spaces and retail are really feeding into the town center area, but they can also be easily accessed by the residential. And then by placing residences on top of that, it's a nice way to help reinvigorate an older town center. A lot of these older town centers you see becoming very heavy in vehicular traffic and less foot traffic. And by placing units right into the downtown, it's more likely that you're gonna have people on foot going to the store. So it's a nice way to play into the mixed use feel. And then when we get into the elevations, the first part that I will note is the building height. Um, the building height is found by finding the average grade of the building. I used the four corners that were surveyed, and then I'm allowed 35 feet, and that can go to the, let me grab my page because I can't read, it's up there. That can go to the mean level of the highest gable as it's written, or to the top of structure. We decided to go with the mean level of the highest gable, and I'll get into the roof structure and a rendering. And then in terms of materials, there is a change up from what we proposed. We're now proposing that the whole building would be the cedar impressions by certainty, but we'd like to have a color change. The first level would be, we're, we have charcoal gray up there now, but a dark gray, and then the upper would be cedar blend. I do have samples of that here tonight if anyone would like to see it. Um, and then there's also fenestration change between the lower office and retail space and the upper residential. We go from fixed encasement windows on the first floor with no divisions to double hung encasement windows on the upper residential floors with divisions in them, so denoting the difference in use, but it also starts to break up the structure into different pieces. And then at the corner here on the retail, 
We've put in full windows wrapping around that entire corner. We have fixed windows at the top with smaller awnings at the bottom to allow some airflow. But it's really starting to break that piece off where it is sitting at the intersection. You'll see it in some renderings. And this doesn't read very well, but I did just want to note where the signage was that I called out. Right here we have our windows at the retail space. Good opportunity for some window signage. We have um, lead-coated copper canopy back here at the office space. So an, an opportunity for awning signage. And then finally our rear entry where we could have some wall signage for direction, uh, a directory on the wall. Quickly just go through the elevations of the garage. It's our eight bays. We've kept it with the same material as the re residential component. And then we have used the pitched roof and added a couple of gables to break up the long roof and also add some balance and symmetry, give it a more traditional feel. Um, and then we're using articulated doors with lights just to give it that residential feel and dress it up. So when we go into the renderings, the first one here, sorry, this stuff does not read on this wall. Um, over here on Shore Road, this red dot represents where you're standing or driving. So you're coming along from the residential end. And this is where the office protrudes forward. You can see the windows are still more broken up. So it ties back into that residential scale next door. And again, that wing projects forward and divides the space from the residential over here and our retail space. And this is where I just want to note the roof design. What we did here, rather than putting the pitched roof all the way on the top of the third story, we dropped it down and we overlaid a 9 and 12 pitch with a 3 and 12 shed dormer, helping to give the cottage feel that's more in keeping with Shore Road, but it also brings the massing down and helps the building to feel its scale with what's around it. We Can wrapped. I ask you a quick question? Sure. On the rake there, what's the, uh, the uh, extension from the face of the gable? What's the length of the extension? Yeah. I think it was running around two and a half feet, but I, two to two and a half, but I'm going to have to really, when I do my roof design, to make sure everything meets. So if there would be. Because that, the reason I asked, that looks good, whereas if you start pulling it back. No, we wanted to keep a longer overhang okay. and then. I, I'm also going to have to keep that longer overhang because I'm meeting so the problem with working with an existing geometry and then bringing these roofs together. So it's going to vary a little bit here and there as the different pitches meet, but it was two to two and a half when I was running it. Okay. Now as we wrap around the front a little bit, the two wings start to frame the um, main entrance off of Shore Road and we've put the formal canopy above that and then we've also added stone half walls around that with um, columns and you plant out next to that and have your path through the front uh, entrance so you're drawn into that center portion. And at this point, the retail space, you can start to see the transparency of it as you can see through the other side of the building. I just added a little night shot here to show how the recessed cans would illuminate some of those volumes that are formed by the roofs of the entry and then over the decks. So you'd have your residential component that would light up at night, but some of those would help to light up the outside softly and create warmth. And then I also like to drop those images into the actual site. So here you see the trees that are in the front yard and all of the green that uh, is on the side. So between that and the added plantings, we feel that this would really uh, become one with the site quickly. Rounding the corner, at the, uh, we're at the access road and shore road. So here that retail corner pops forward and we're just showing that that's a great site for a retail component. Their entrance is over here. There are actually a few existing parking spots sitting up front. But it's one of the first things you'd see as you come off of 77 and turn up Shore Road. So it's presenting itself. And again, in context with those trees in front, but that, that area still projects forward, so it becomes a desirable retail space. As we round the back, this is the elevation that you would see from the parking lot up close. So again, you can see that steeper pitch 9 and 12 roof with the 3 and 12 projecting upward to create our volume inside on the third floor. And then we have our office space that you can enter back there where there's the chance for signage. And you have your entrance to the corridor where you would have wall signage over there. As we back up, you can see the garage included in the uh, imagery. And what's nice about this is that the shape of the building turning into the garage creates this L and it's a complementary relationship to the residential next door. It blocks the view of the cars, it's going to block the lighting at night. Um, and we think that that benefits the neighbors. 
And then finally, again, this doesn't show up very well here, but just an evening shot. We have a few pole lights out in the uh, parking lot to help illuminate it, but we decided to put some of the lighting up against the garage, add to a slight residential feel, but also use that wall and those uh, wall sconces to bounce some light off of that rather than having to add more pole lights. But all in all, we have created a project that we believe is sensitive to the boundary between the commercial and residential on which it lies. And it's an architecture that ties into both and works to create a sense of scale. And it doesn't make the transition too abruptly. So it creates an inviting structure for all of the proposed uses. And the addition of a mixed use project to this site allows it to be a supportive project to a smaller New England community. So that's where we are. Thank you. All right, I'll open this up for public comment, but I can close it because there's nobody here except us. So, to the board. Completeness. Looks pretty complete. <laughs> it does now. You may go ahead. Now. I just want to thank the, uh, the applicants. What we just saw was the kind of plan package I think we'd like to see. And I, I appreciate the effort. So, any, anything that people think needs to be tweaked and as far as completeness goes? So. I know it's late. <laughs> yeah. no, Carolyn, I, I just have this, this one lingering concern about Sebago saying in comment number two in his letter, we don't think the package can be considered complete. I think we should face that and disagree with him respectfully or, well, or not. Well, this package was not complete. What they just presented. What they just presented is what? this package plus. So they okay, presented it's, more it's, than was included. Uh, let's, let's say so then. That, so, okay. You know, we appreciate yeah. their comment, but the additional information presented yep. reached a level of completeness. Since, since the uh, and town engineer had a chance to review it, we received additional information. Do you want to hold up your samples of the vinyl? This is the charcoal gray. Does anybody actually want to? Have to okay. And then I didn't like the cedar color I chose, so I have to be the cedar blend. <laughs> So, if no one's got any questions, where do we go from here, guys? <laughs> What's the, um, the, just the issue with regards to parking? You guys look, wanted to, um, I think there were two spots that you were looking to get mixed use on, and I just want to kind of touch base with Maureen on that. Is that uh, something we can do? Yes, and, and I guess I, I want to make clear that we did have some problems this month with uh, projects not calculating from exterior uh, building uh, lines in order to calculate how much parking they needed. I think this applicant has made an effort to um, adjust their parking calculation. I, until I can sit down and actually add it up, I'm not going to say it's okay. Uh, but so there's that piece. But then uh, let's say we they calculate out all their parking correctly and they do not have the total number of parking spaces they need. What they can then present to the board is a proposal that the office and retail, let's just say office, let's just say the office parking is really a, something that you need during the day, during the week. And that most of the residential parking or maybe some of the retail parking, you don't need it during the same time that the office parking is. So they may make a case to you that there's an opportunity for one space to be shared by more than one use as long as there's a reasonable expectation that that use doesn't need that space at the same time. So for example, let's say they, they've got eight and they need like 14 spaces for the residential and they say we want to share four of those 14 with the office. You have the right under our current provisions to agree to that. There is a shared parking provision that they have to make the case and you have to accept it as reasonable. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, 
As far as completeness goes, are we ready for a motion? Or just waiting. I have a motion. Okay. Motion for completeness. Be ordered. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of 1226 Shore Road LLC for site plan review of a mixed use office retail eight apartment building expansion located at 1226 Shore Road be deemed complete with the following waiver of information depiction of trees eight inches or larger in diameter on the plans. Second. Okay. Joe seconds. Thank you, Joe. Any further comment on completeness? All those in favor? Unanimous. All right. <coughs> I know. I was going to say that. Site walk. Please not next week. <laughs> but when do we want to schedule a site walk for this? We want to do it the following week. Can, can, we, do it? can we do it? Yeah, you can do it. You can do it the first week in October. Can we do it the first week in October? We have a workshop on the third. Can we do it before that? Since we can just walk right idea. over. Five thirty. Per day. The third? on Tuesday, October third. Your well, your your workshop is at seven, we'll so you could one. do it at six. Okay. Would it be light? Yeah, it'll be light enough. Mm -hmm. Six to seven, you'll be all right. It'll look like that. It's not really a huge site. The evening shot. Yeah. It's still up there. So six o'clock. Six on p.m. on October third. I, I mean, it's not. I mean, it's not like you know. We just have to walk across the parking lot to our meeting. So. <laughs> Easy enough. Thank you. And it's all right if we park. Well, we, I'm assuming most of you are going to park here and then just walk over. Yeah. 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 You can park that way. What time is it? We said six o'clock. Six o'clock. What? So we'll right. go right from there to here. You said yeah. five thirty. Six o'clock. I said I said park here. Yeah. Be there at six o'clock. Six o'clock. <laughs> it's not a big site, and then you just walk back here for your workshop at seven. You're gonna email it. I'm gonna email it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna email it to you. Not that you'll forget. All right. So we have another motion here. Anyone want to make that motion? I can do it. Go for it. Uh, motion to table to public hearing be in order that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of 1226 Shore Road LLC for site plan review of a mixed use to office retail eight apartment building uh, expansion located at 1226 Shore Road be tabled to the regular October 17, 2017 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Joe seconds. All those in favor? <clears throat> All right, we're good. Thank you. Thank you for your stick to it -iveness. <laughs> All right, now I'm waiting for, oh, I guess I'm supposed to ask for public comment that's not on the agenda, but there's no public here, so. My comment is there's a long meeting. Yeah. All right, uh, I'm waiting for one more motion. Move to okay, do I have second. a second? Second. Okay, Jonathan seconds. All those in favor? Yay. <laughs>